reconvene to open session. The board previously met in closed session. Trustee Hupp, will you please read the actions taken by the board in closed session? In closed session, the board voted to approve the issuance of charges for dismissal against one employee from their classified position pursuant to Education Code 45113. And in closed session, the board voted to approve the terms of a settlement agreement for the Office, office of Administrative Hearing. <laughs> I can't read that number. Sorry, Tony. Um, student number 10202021 10, and to authorize the superintendent to execute the agreement on behalf of the district. Tonight we have Anna Fishburn with, from Whitney High School with us as our student board representative. Welcome, Anna. Will you please introduce our color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Whitney High School Air Force Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's color guard is Cadet, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Aiden Fitzer. The state flag is carried by Cadet Master Sergeant Heaven Green. The right guard is Cadet Captain Lucas Steyer. The left guard is Cadet Captain Micah Weber. The alternate for tonight is Cadet First Lieutenant Eric Adamic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. The meeting is available via live stream for our public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website or on board agenda item 1.1. The board will accept both verbal and written comments to anyone who wishes to submit a written comment can find the instructions on agenda item 1.1. If you're planning to address the board tonight, please fill out a green public comment card, turn them in prior to the agenda, be, agenda item sorry, being closed. Cards must be filled out completely. We can't uh, call on you if your card's not complete. I'll call the name, step up to the podium, and let you know who's on deck to follow you up. Uh, when you approach the podium, restate your name, city you live in, the school your children attend. All public comments will be addressed directly to the board. There's a three-minute uh, time limit per person on one agenda item. I think the crowd will go through three and then into another minute. Um, for everyone else, the board is not permitted to deliberate, take action on non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to staff member for follow-up. Comments must be respectful and professional. Please no profanity. We'll also want to remind the audience that there is no re-entry into the boardroom. Once you leave the building, you'll be, you won't be able to re-enter. So now moving to our special recognition and presentation portion of the meeting. Uh, Chief Dosange. Good evening, President Counter, trustees, and superintendent staff. Tonight, we are happy to bring back the Families Partners in Education program, where we recognize family engagement and involvement to help us to help our students achieve excellence every day. I will now ask Ms. Melanie Patterson, the school principal at Sunset Ranch Elementary, to come up and introduce the Rogowski family. So much. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. It is an honor to stand before you and share in the Sunset Ranch Family Partner in Education. First, however, I wanted to share with you and take this opportunity to share with you a few examples in the past few weeks only of the, the things that demonstrate the many selfless acts that uh, of service the members of our school community provide to us. First, our teachers always go above and beyond. Uh, one simple example, while definitely not necessary or expected, uh, was a teacher at our school at midnight preparing sub plans after a visit to the emergency room to make sure her students were cared for the next day. Um, uh, our classified staff continually care for coyotes. Um, for example, not this last Sunday, but two Sundays ago, uh, uh, Rolinda, Joe, and Craig spent three and a half hours of their Sunday cleaning our entire school. 
so that they, we were ready for Monday morning. Um, our partner schools at, and um, <clears throat> high school students are committed to providing support for Coyotes. We currently have 21 star students from Whitney High School serving on our campus with our students. Um, um, and STAR stands for Students Teaching and Reaching Standards. Um, we also, uh, because of the vision of one Whitney High School junior, her name is Marina Parker, and I can't wait to introduce her to you. This year, we have started the Coyote Math Club, an after-school program where uh, Wildcats come uh, and inspire, support, and engage our students in math after school. And lastly, but not leastly, of course, is our families. The support Sun uh, Sunset Ranch receives from our families is outstanding. And um, they support our students at home in reaching their academic goals, um, but they volunteer in many ways through our PTC. And while there are many families that do so much for our school, our family partner in education is so deserving of this honor. So it's an honor for me to introduce to you the Rogowski family, and I'm going to ask them to join me um, as I introduce each one to you. Trajan, want to come up? He is a sophomore at Whitney High School. He started his school career at Sunset Ranch in kindergarten in 2011. He is an outstanding, uh, his outstanding performance, Trajan, I know is no doubt the result of his commitment from his parents to be involved and dedicated to our educational programs and to you, buddy, huh? Larissa, come on up. She is an eighth grade student at Granite Oats Middle School who has, uh, was promoted from Sunset Ranch in 2020, the year we closed in-person instruction in March. She's demonstrated outstanding perseverance and hard work to thrive during all these challenging times. Great job. And Miles, come on up. Miles is a fifth grade student at Sunset Ranch Elementary. He is exceptionally responsible, and he's a wonderful example of what it means to be a coyote. Um, last but not least, of course, is Ron and Kimberly. Come on up. We are so appreciative, not only for the support they provided over the last 10 years for their children, but also the students and staff at Sunset Ranch. Kim is always available to help in big and small ways. She is a consistent member and volunteer at our PTC, uh, serving for several years as the co-coordinator of our fund run, and that's the largest fundraiser for our school. Uh, she currently serves as, our, as one of our, cop, uh, our in our parent-run copy center. She helps to provide uh, and maximize the time staff have to plan lessons and provide instruction for students. So um, I appreciate that so much. She is, uh, and as one of our teachers shared, Kim has always been a standout with volunteering, but her kindness during some of the most challenging times educators have experienced went above and beyond. So please help me um, applaud the Rogowski family as our family partner in education. a great example of, again, why we all live in Rockland and why we want to raise kids here. Kim has helped out since the day they moved in, up at the PTC, helping out in all the different arrangements, create, getting that fund run going and bringing a lot of excitement. Kids, uh, those of you that don't live in Whitney Ranch area, there's uh, Bolton Park, and when that comes up, there's just a, a mess of kids running around, high-fiving each other. It's just a great, fun, exciting time seen Ron personally out at Sunset Ranch multiple times, running the barbecues for all the different events that they had, and that Trajan, Larissa, and Miles always helping out. So again, this is one of those great families that, again, why we live in, in, uh, in Rockland, California, why we want to raise our kids here, why the schools are so great. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you, and again, thank you guys for, here, you get a little certificate. Thank you for everything you guys do. Thank, thank you. you.
Now to agenda item 5.2, introduction of Whitney High School Assistant Principal, Tony Lamoge, all yours. Thank you, President Counter. Good evening, trustees, Superintendent Stock, Ms. Brenda. Tonight, I always have the pleasure of introducing uh, new administrators within the district, and tonight, I'm introducing a new assistant principal at Whitney High School. The district opened one administrator position in August for uh, high school assistant principal, Whitney High School. A total of 18 applications were received. Six of those candidates were interviewed. And of the six interviewed, five were internal candidates. The board had the opportunity to approve uh, the individual that I'm uh, presenting this evening, uh, Ms. Penny Shelton. Come on down. Penny Shelton is the new assistant principal at Whitney High School. Uh, Penny recently served as AP Biology, uh, Anatomy and Physiology, Biology, Chemistry, uh, a plethora of science classes, and was department chair as well as uh, a GSA advisor. Also did credit recovery biology at Whitney High School and has been with the district since 2001. So very excited to uh, have the opportunity. Also has been very involved in athletics throughout her career. Uh, with the district, and it's always great to promote someone internally. Uh, again, I'm proud to uh, present to you, uh, Ms. Penny Shelton. Please uh, share with who is with you and to speak with the board. Well, thank you so much. I really am so appreciative of this opportunity to serve at Whitney High School. Um, it's also extra special to actually be looking here at two of my former students who are also up here too, so it's been a while. Um, but I am here actually with my two daughters, my daughter, Samantha, um, Whitney High School, class of 2017, and my daughter, Sydney, East Nicholas High School, class of 2021. <laughs> so thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to being able to serve the staff and the students in this community. Thank you. Ms. Shelton, I, uh, I can't call you by the first name because uh, all of my memories of you are Ms. Shelton, my biology teacher. So I apologize. Uh, I was hoping I still had that biology book around. I didn't seem to find it. Um, but I so appreciate the opportunity to see you in this arena, in this involvement. Um, and uh, my love for science, I really do believe, came from you. And I say that wholeheartedly. Um, I was very excited when I saw um, you come through. Um, and I was hoping it was the Ms. Shelton I remembered. And it was so Absolutely. congratulations thank you miss gardner <laughs> penny you were never my teacher so <laughs> welcome we're very excited to have you my only regret is that we lost you in the science department but other than that i think we're very lucky to get you for this position so thank you for considering it and congratulations Welcome. I love it when we can promote within, and we're excited to have you and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to echo my thanks and appreciation. I'm excited. There's actually a lot of work to do at Whitney. There's a lot of great things happening. It's exciting for you to take them. I was particularly excited about your work on an A through G. I do think it's something we need to focus on more going forward, make sure we're getting all kids ready uh, for competing in the, in the new economy, and I really appreciate your role in this. Thank you. Thank you. I was fortunate enough to have Ms. Shelton as my teacher for anatomy last year, <laughs> and I just wanted to say that um, I know myself, and a lot of us who did have you last year when we found out that you were our new vice principal is just pure joy and excitement. And I'm just so like happy that we have someone that we can connect to as students. So thank you for everything. So I won't say welcome because you're already here. So once a wildcat, always a wildcat. Thank you very much. Keep going and great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're good. Good job. Thank you. Penny, Whitney. All right. Moving now to employee organization reports. Welcome CSEA President Chuck Haddix for the CSEA report. Good evening, President Counter, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. Tonight, the CSEA does not have any report to give you tonight. We'll make it simple. 
All right. No news is good news. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chuck. All right. We now welcome Emily Thomas to present the RTPA report for Travis Mojet, who will be away tonight with family commitment. Ms. Thomas? Good evening, members of the board, superintendent stock, and stakeholders of the Rockland Unified School District who are listening from home. As the bargaining chair, I'm here tonight to express my gratitude and my deep relief that RTPA and the district were able to settle contracts for both the 2021 and 21 22 school years. I fully understand that reaching an agreement required the work of many parties, and I'm extremely grateful to all parties involved that the contracts have been signed off on. Congratulations to all of us on a job well done. As with many accomplishments, as we celebrate the success of one, we must look forward and begin to prepare for those challenges that still lie ahead of us. The immediate challenge that I'd like to discuss this evening is, is the negotiation of the 22-23 contract. I urge the board to work closely with the business operations team to ensure that when negotiations begin on the morning of December 1st, the district team has proposals ready for all articles. In my admittedly limited time, I've seen the district wait five to six meetings before bringing an offer to the table on wages and benefits. This slows the process and violates the idea of good faith bargaining. I challenge all of us, RTPA as well, to move forward in a manner that honors the work being done in our labor management group and the words spoken at so many of these public meetings. Let's do better. Let's close this contract before the school year ends. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now moving to item 7.1, comments from our student representative, Anna Fishburn. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Stock. As we continue moving forward into the school year, the schools in the district are continuing to have exciting events to promote a positive environment for our students. At Breen Elementary, their student leadership team is in full swing. They're working in shifts to clean up the trash they see around campus, and their leaders are also selling boo grams for Halloween to earn money for school improvements, such as benches by the library. Breen's garden was also recently featured on Good Day Sacramento. At Parker Whitney, it's Socktober. Socktober is an annual clothing drive where in the month of October, the second grade classes will be con collecting donations of new socks. At the end of the month, they will be donating them to a local shelter. At Rock Creek Elementary, th third grade students went to the planetarium at Sac State and first grade students went to the pumpkin patch at Bishop's and they are excited to have field trips again. The student council leaders of the pack at Sunset Ranch Elementary have been elected and are already working on planning events for Red Ribbon Week later this month, and their students are excited about the upcoming costume parade and fun they have planned for October 29th. Rockland High School is coming out of an amazing homecoming week and are glad to have the experience of a high school homecoming back on their campus. At Whitney, we finished a successful circus-themed homecoming at the beginning of October, where the seniors brought home the win and the week's spirit points for our final homecoming. We are currently looking forward to breaking down the walls and senior night. At Breaking Down the Walls, we will continue to develop a positive environment on our campus and foster new relationships between our students. Springview Middle School is participating in Breaking Down the Walls as well, and Rockland High School finished Breaking Down the Walls last month. We look forward to honoring our dance, cheer, band, and football seniors on Friday, October 29th, and closing out our regular season football games with another great student section. Beginning next week, our school will be transitioning into a trial period of the PLUS schedule similar to Rockland High School. Our club officers hope to work actively with our administration in a joint effort to support our clubs in finding new meeting times. This is imperative as our club culture is thriving right now with about 50 active clubs. Thank you for your time. Trustees, do you have any board comments you'd like to share tonight? Okay, I'll start. So first of all, I am really excited to hear uh, the student report. Um, I love to hear about all the normal stuff that's happening on campuses. That's fantastic. Homecomings are going along great. All the planning and the executing for one and now the other. Um, breaking down the walls is amazing. I'm so glad we're able to bring that into our schools. Dance, cheer, band, it's all moving along, um, and that's awesome. 
And in regards to RTPA, I'm also very excited that the contract has been negotiated and closed for now. That's excellent. I do think um, as we talk about doing better, <laughs> I hope part of doing better is our communication, our communication with each other, but also our communication to the public, because it is a process that we have to follow going um, through negotiating the contract. And sometimes there is time in between the negotiation cycles. And if we can communicate that better to the public, that would be great, because, especially the teachers. If we can communicate that better to the teachers, that would be great, because I think there's sometimes the opinion that we're not doing anything, but it's just that things are being done behind closed doors, but they are being done and things are being moved along as quickly as possible. So I hope we can, as we do better, we can communicate that. Um, and then on a personal note, um, the things that have come out since the last board meeting, the mandate, the vaccine mandate, I, it's, very frustrating. I mean, I think anyone who's been to any of our board meetings knows where most of us stand on these policies that are uh, being forced upon us. I will say, um, I personally will never vote to vaccinate our kids. It's Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hang on. We don't have the power to stop what the governor is doing, but I will never vote to make that. Uh, we'll never get ahead of it. We'll never um, do something. We'll never do anything. I will never do anything more than we have to do, than we are required to do. We'll never do it early. We'll never do it first. We'll never agree to it. And I think that... Um, I'll just speaking for myself, I would love to see um, school boards in the area coming together. I would love to work together. Um, the more we can stand together, the better. Um, I am not anti-vax. I am not anti-vax, but I am anti-mandate. I do think that people have to choose for themselves. And I've said that all along. That's not shocking to come out of my mouth up here. I think when it comes to our children's health, our children's health that's up to us to decide. Um, and I am absolutely terrified what this mandate will do to public education. I l love public education to every fiber of my being. I've been in it all of my adult life. And it is my passion. I love working with the children. And to think that a large percentage will no longer be allowed on campus is unacceptable. And I think um, even people who want to have children vaccinated, people who want to see everyone, everyone, everyone vaccinated, I don't know how we can stand and say, because of that belief, it's okay to exclude children from coming on campus in our public schools. So that's where I stand, and I will, I will stand on that hill. Thank you. Well, I have uh, just a few moments of thanks. Uh, Anna, I wanted to thank you. It was uh, such a joy for us to sit down at our two by two uh, with our students. That was a newly created committee last year. Um, and it gives me a great excuse to try some crumble cookies with you all. <laughs> um, but I really, really appreciate the feedback that you have. I have to say what an incredible testament to our teachers and our teams. We have some incredible presidents that you are leading your campuses. And so I really thoroughly enjoyed getting to talk, talk about dress code and hear some of the ideas of how you would like to see those processes work to include student voices. So I wanted to take a second to say thank you for that because that took time outside of the school day for you to come meet with a couple boring board members <laughs> and share really though perspectives of students on campus. So I really do value that time. Thank you. 
I also wanted to take a second, uh, just a note of appreciation to the teams that work together, RTPA, all of our teams um, on contract negotiations. I so appreciate that being resolved. Um, I, I am, am hopeful as well that we can continue to move forward together as quickly as possible on all future negotiations. Um, but I do want to give my heart held, heartfelt thanks to every single person involved in that process. Um, so thank you for that. Um, also, I just wanted to say how, what a joy it was right before this meeting. Uh, we were able to honor some of our classified personnel for 10, 15, 20, 25, 35 years of service. And I just think that is absolutely incredible for our district to have individuals that have committed 35 years of their lives to work here. And I look forward to the opportunity to actually celebrate um, our certified personnel as well, certificated. Um, with that, I also, I have a few uh, notes that I prepared. Uh, I think it would, um, I think it's important that I just share a few of my thoughts. I don't think many of them will be a surprise, um, but I do think it's important that as uh, board members um, that we are transparent and share with you where we're at on big issues. And there are some big issues right now that a lot of people are talking about. Um, I do want to share for, for months now, I do feel I have been harassed and intimidated and bullied and questioned about wearing a mask. The interesting thing is, is no one has ever asked, not once, if I have a medical exemption on file. Just constantly berated me, both privately via email and Facebook messages and publicly at board meetings. And now to my co-board members demanding they force me to wear a mask. I've heard from parents that these are some of the very same experiences our students with medical exemptions on file are experiencing. This is not okay. Boards throughout the state have struggled with mandates. I have not been shy to share my own struggles with mandates inconsistent with our own local conditions. This past summer I asked, where's the line? How far is too far? The constant reply I heard throughout our county was, if a COVID-19 vaccine is mandated, that will be the line. We are now here at that line. This last week, 350 teachers here in RUSD alone had to test to be allowed to do the job they have done safely the past two years without a mandated vaccine. I find it incredible and selfless that they are testing weekly, knowing full well that in nine months or possibly sooner, depending on FDA approval, they will be out of jobs if they do not comply with a state mandate to vaccinate. This is not okay. These are the same teachers that trusted us and showed up to teach our students at every phase of our reopening. We will soon have to deny students the right to an equal in-person education, completely overstepping parental rights if they do not give in to the state coercion to vaccinate with a shot with virtually no long-term data on adverse side effects. This is not okay. In just the past two days, members of five other local school boards have reached out directly to me asking to collaborate to push back on these arbitrary state mandates. Our concerns are not isolated. We are not alone. Superintendent Stock, I would like to see us take the next step to request legal counsel to please prepare a memo with every option. <laughs> with every option, including legal action that we as a board can take to push back on these mandates, specifically the weekly testing of healthy teachers and forced vaccination of students and staff. I'm happy to be here tonight. We are a fourth of the way into our school year and it's going amazing. I'm on campuses and I see happy students to be back in person and together and I see happy teachers and staff and it's awesome. Um, I love hearing all of the things that are going on in our district and um, again get emotional when I'm at events and see our community out and rallying together. I, um, I'd like to share some of the things that I do in between meetings. So um, I, I visited a few campuses this time including uh, Joe McLean invited us um, as a board and Superintendent Stock to join him. 
in an integrated one math class at Springview. And it was really cool because I serve on the Rockland Education for Excellence Foundation and he was granted one of the grants that we give to teachers and has whiteboards covering almost every wall of his room, I think. And these students were able to stand and work together on questions that were way above my math level. Um, it was actually a structured problem solving activity. It was pretty, pretty impressive to watch these kids uh, work through it. And it was really rewarding to be there. And I, I loved um, when our Sunset Ranch principal talked about things above and beyond. I was at Twin Oaks this last week uh, walking around with a teacher who had invited me in. And at the end of our uh, conversation, we were outside actually looking at the playground equipment, and she said to a fellow teacher, hey, just one second before, before you walk off, uh, tomorrow's Friday, and every Friday I bring a teacher uh, Starbucks. What would you like? There are things like that happening all the time, right? And I wish we could highlight all of them, and of course we can't, but I do appreciate those little acts that go often unseen among staff and for our students. Um, I uh, also attended the Starlight Sorier fundraising event hosted by Reef, where we recognized students that last year were given, we gave uh, $25,000 in student scholarships. And Whitney High School culinary students served, helped serve dinner that was provided by our local chef's table. And Rockland High School had a small jazz band that was amazing. And Reef raised a lot of money for Rockland, and I want to give them a shout out because it was a great event, and I really appreciate all the efforts um, that happened there to contribute money for extra things. Um, last, I, I too just want to share um, my personal wrestle and struggle with uh, Governor Newsom's mandate announced October 1st. The California School Board Association that we are members of and that I'm a delegate for their president said, um, these decisions are better left to the people at the state level, and I completely disagree. I believe that these choices are best left to parents, and not only is it, should it be their choice, it is their right. I believe in the freedom to choose our own medical procedures. The exemptions were removed in 2015, and I don't trust that they won't be removed again. I am not anti-vaccine. I am pro-parent choice. And what's best for you and for your family and for your student. If you choose the vaccine, I stand with you. And if you choose not to vaccinate, I stand with you. I just want to continue. Is I, I have the same experience you have. There's some amazing things going on in our classrooms every day. And uh, I just want to take a moment to pause and, and appreciate that. There's been, Joe's an example of this uh, really incredible innovation going on in our schools. It's not, we're just not teaching math. We're thinking differently about how to teach math. We're thinking th differently about how to make kids are learning and not learning just arithmetic. We're actually learning higher level thinking skills. And what you saw in this experience was kids thinking through a problem, regardless of the math in front, thinking through how do you think of differently. And it's that, those kind of thinking skills and that's kind of education that's actually going to improve us and make us better every single day. And you're seeing that across the board in all of our classrooms. And in this crazy year, uh, it is amazing the amount of high quality instruction going on in every classroom in Rockland. Uh, and I wish everyone could experience having time spent with our teachers because it really is great. And I will say at the high schools, you know, homecoming rallies coming off in, in trying times of making it work and a great games making it work. And so it, it does feel like we are really coming back in a meaningful way. And it's a credit to our principals and our administration and our, they're thinking of how to make this work, make this work safe and make it work doable for kids. Um, and I'm excited to sort of see where we are and where we're going. So thanks. Uh, I can keep on the same theme. So again, it, it's just great to see things moving forward. Um, pe people, teams coming together, working through problems, finding solutions, and moving forward. That's, that's all we can hope for. Um, it was great to have family recognitions and those things coming back. Great to see the years of service. Again, as, as Tiffany said, 35 years. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. You, you do the math and it's like, wow, where was I at that point? But just amazing that those, those are the people within our district that again, make educational excellence you know, a reality. So it, it's just great to see. Um, great to see breaking down the walls, um, the homecoming at, at both high schools, amazing, great games, great events, uh, great fans, great, uh, just 
all around. And, and if you haven't, if you haven't gone out and seen those things, haven't been around the kids, um, please do. It, it's just great to see everyone smiling and cheering. I know the senior nights are coming up for for those students. I know uh, the sports happening right now. So again, great to see all that stuff. Um, and again, to those Reef supporters and the sponsors, thank you very much for everything that you've done for the event and, and leading up to this point and throughout the year. Those are great things that help not only our schools and our students and, and the programs that we have. And it really puts us at a, at, a, at a higher position than what the state gives you to support. So that's a really great thing. I can say, um, again, comments like, like most of the board folks here tonight, it is very frustrating with the mandate. Um, we don't exactly know what is all in and out. As of right now, it's essentially a press release that this is what I'm going to do, but it still has to go through the legislative bodies and figure out exactly what it looks like. Um, I, like all the other board members, and, and you'll hear you know, most of us across the state, you want, we came to this event and we came towards the board to have that local control to, to make decisions that are right for Rockland and Rockland students and Rockland families. It is very frustrating um, when you're put in positions to you have to do it this way and this is what we say. Um, for those of us that live here in Northern California in this area, the large group about 25 miles south of us, the governor, the legislator, and the Congress, those are the people that are, that are making these calls. If it were pure local control, we would, we would come up here, we would vote, and we would move forward. We saw that getting the kids back into school. We were able to do some great things there. We've gone through the mass mandates and, and we'll continue to go through these other ones. It's, it's, a, it's frustrating, but it is a one-way street. We don't like it. We're trying to work through it. We had, we had a, a universal um, conversation. We sent a great letter off to the state to try to reserve that local control and, and push back on things. And that was met with silence. So I'm hoping cross my fingers that, that we can move forward, we can begin to work together and we can figure out, you know, what's good for Placer County is Placer County, what's good for LA County is LA County, what's good for Rockland is Rockland, what's good for San Diego, et cetera. Let, let, let us figure out what we need to do to make it right and, and we'll move forward for us and our kids and our families. But it is, it is extremely frustrating. And I know there'll be a lot of people here tonight and, and we'll go through the process of public comment and, and we'll hear from everybody. Um, just know that Everyone that comes up here tonight is gonna to have a different perspective. Please listen. I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with anything they say. I'm not asking you for support or, or to antagonize. Um, these issues are multifaceted. Everyone comes up with their perspective. This is one of those avenues where people can come up and speak and, 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 and we'll have that process, but please be respectful. And um, when that comes time later in the night, we'll go through that process, so. Superintendent Stock, sorry for an elongated conversation. Do you have anything to share? Uh, no, just to, not to repeat all the, all the other great things that were mentioned, but just to emphasize that our, our employees that we honored, uh, just a couple kind of mind-numbing statistics. We invited 79 of our classified employees, which represented 1,215 years of service, just out of those 79. That is just, you know, again, phenomenal of the, of the folks that show up every day and, and do the hard work that, that make this place work for our kids. And the other piece of just gratitude is, uh, our next board meeting will be after November 11th, and we are so blessed to have many veterans serve in our, in our employee ranks and as part of our families and community, and just to thank all of the veterans for what they've done for, for our society, our country, and, and for their great service. And it's great to see when we see our junior ROTC students as part of our school district and, and that program as well. So just gratitude for, for that service to our country. And, and then again, it's just uh, the, it is great to hear uh, our students and, and seeing so many things going on in our schools and um, in that, and even hearing the work of one of the board's main priorities, which is improving math education to hear Whitney High School students. So Anna, thank you to your, your fellow students for going out to Sunset Ranch, helping and that that's on their own. Uh, working with our math improvement team last week to allow us, they're diving into deep. We did a ton of interviews with students and staff and even parents. So I was calling up 11th grade parents and saying, hi, this is the superintendent. I wanna to talk to you about your child. And they were like, what did they do wrong? Oh my gosh, you're calling. No, I wanna to talk to you about how they're doing in math. And, and so really those conversations help us all collaborate and focus together, whether it's solving math or solving any other challenges that we have before us. So 
uh, much work to do, uh, and, and we'll, I'm sure, get started on that tonight in our meeting. Consent agenda. So all matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Trustees, or there will be no separate discussion of these items unless the board of trustee audience or staff request specific items be removed from the consent calendar for specific discussion and action. Any agenda item removed will be voted on following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent agenda separate for separate discussion or action? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Move by second. Second. Seconded by Julie. All right. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Anna Fishburn? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. T uh, Tiffany Satoff? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Motion passes. Now on to item 9.1, action on AB 1200 bargaining disclosures for Rockland Teachers Professional Association. Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent of Business and Operations. Good evening, President Catter, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. Assembly Bill 1200 requires local education agencies to publicly disclose the provisions of all collective bargaining agreements before entering into a written agreement. It also requires the superintendent and chief business official certify in writing that the costs incurred by the school district under the agreement can be met by the district during the term of the agreement. The certifications are on pages 8 through 10 of the disclosure agreement in board docs. A multi-year projection with these costs included is also required and is included at the end of the AB 1200 public disclosure document. The information on settlement terms and costs disclosed tonight are for the uh, RTPA bargaining unit. The total cost for a one-time payment of $2,000 for 2020-21, a 4% increase to the base salary schedule and stipend salary schedules that are included in the RTPA contract retroactive to July 1, 2021, along with the cost for a one-time $1,000 payment for the additional work required to provide independent study to our students during the 2021-22 year are presented tonight. The total cost for this agreement is $4,625,000. I'm sorry, $4,625,661 in the current year right. and about $10.1 million over the three year term. Staff recommends approval of the AB 1200 public disclosure of proposed collective bargaining agreement with RTPA. Are there any board comments or questions? Just thank you so much, Barbara. I know that was a ton of work to put that together. And just for those who don't know, I could call any time, day or night, and Barbara's here working. She works so hard, and it is really appreciated. Really, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, I, I want to uh, second that. So I, I just want to say, I, for, actually, I want to say in general, I, I'm, I'm really happy with where this ended. I think this is, uh, puts us in a good place. Barbara, I want to appreciate your time and the amount of effort you put into making these. So I also, Tony, want to thank you for the effort you put in at the table to bring us along. And I also want to thank our TPA leadership and bargaining teams to actually come to this agreement. I think it's an important step forward for us. But I think we all agree that it is, it is a step. We're not done. Next year is going to be immensely harder. <laughs> it's going to be much, much harder. And so starting now to actually build those relationships to think about how we're going to deal with each other, how we're going to talk, how we're going to think about what's best for us uh, collectively uh, is, is a long road that I think this is a down payment in that, in that come forward. I will say, uh, I think it's important to, to, to uh, uh, Julie's point around the process. So um, it takes time. And I think what you heard the board say last year, and you will hear us this year, and you will hear us say next year, is we will not put a final offer on until we know what our budget is. We just won't until we know what our enrollment is, until we know how much money we're getting in a COLA from the governor, what the governor's budget is. It, it would be fiscally irresponsible for us to make offers without knowing what it is. What we said consistently was once we know, whatever we have, we will tr prioritize teachers because they're the reason our district is great. And I think we've shown that's exactly what we did. We put all the dollars on the table that was reasonable and it was fair given the amount of COLA we got and given about, and, but given about the, uh, um, declining enrollment we saw as well. 
So as a result, I think it is, it, this is a huge step forward. I'm very excited about it. It is absolutely reason for celebration, and I'm excited to getting to work right t tomorrow to start thinking about how we prepare for next year to make sure that we continue this sort of goodwill moving forward. Thanks. So, thank you very much for the work. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, RTPA. Thank you, everybody, for, for the hours, the conversations, the meetings. The, the, all the process, and it is a process. For those, for those folks in, in listening at home or, or in attendance here, it's not, it's not just buying a car. It's not just walking in and paying for groceries. It's, it's, there's a lot of back and forth, there's a lot of conversations, there's a lot of modeling. If I do this, then this, if I do that, then that. And there's a lot of assumptions you have to put in. And then, and then as Rick was saying, there's a lot of things in the beginning you assume number A, and then later it comes in at number B, and then it looks like it's A.3, but then it's B.7, and then this changes and that changes. So I know, thank you, Barbara, for the, for the work. Thank you, Tony, for the, for the constant conversations and updates, and, and thank you, everybody, for working through it. I'm hoping we're, we're in a better position now, and we can move forward, and, and we can continue to work together to get better. So thank you. I, I move the, I, I move 9.1. Second. Mm -hmm. All right. Second. All right. So we have a motion to approve AB 1200 and the seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Item 9.2, action on Rockland Teacher Professional Association tentative agreement on proposed salary schedules. Tony Lamont. Thank you, President Counter. Uh, with all due respect, Trustee Miller, I think I speak for both teams that we're not ready to start tomorrow. We'd like to take a little bit of, <laughs> little bit of downtime. Just... So tonight on February 5th, right. 2020, the Board of Trustees was presented with RTPA's 2020-2021 initial contract proposal and Rockland Unified School District's contract proposal, which is referred to as the sunshining process. Both were accepted and public hearing was held on March 4th with negotiations beginning uh, March 13th. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, negotiations obviously became virtual. We negotiated many side MOUs and unfortunately we had to put some of our regular negotiation items on to the side as we negotiated more pressing issues. However, tonight I present to you after much collaboration, we're able to uh, negotiate agreement that I'm presenting uh, to you this evening. On September 28, 2021, Rockland Unified School District and Rockland Teachers Professional Association uh, accepted a tentative agreement was reached to resolve contract negotiations for the 2021 and 2022 school years as follows. For 2021, a uh, $2,000 to be paid in a one-time payment no later than November 17, 2021. This amount was to be prorated for part-time FTE and prorated for those working less than a complete school year, which was done in honor of, of all the hard work and acknowledgement that the board supported uh, during the pandemic. For 2021-2022, effective July 1st, 2021, a 4% increase to the RTPA bargaining unit salary schedules, appendices C through E. The retroactive amount will be paid no later than November 17th, 2001. In addition, a $1,000 uh, one-time payment uh, was to be paid no later than November 17th, and that was because of many of the, that was earmarked specifically for the work that our teachers and certificated staff were doing to in preparation for the independent study required for students who were on quarantine, et cetera, et cetera. So this amount as well will be prorated for part-time uh, FTE and prorated for those working less than a complete school year. After that mouthful, um, I'm asking the recommending to the board take action on Rockland Teachers Professional Association tentative agreement and proposed salary schedules. Yeah, good. I motion. No comments. Yeah. Just want to make sure you just have no comments. All right. All right. So before you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, now invite Curtis Borton to come forward to the podium and address the board for public comment on this agenda item. So uh, while the compensation is great as far as money and we talk about the numbers and all this very business-like, I would like to hope that somewhere in this you would include more acknowledgments to your teachers. While we did have admin that was introduced and I know you guys have 
ceremonies for things that are outside of the board. Been to now five of these, and I've yet to see a teacher recognized for the things that they do, unless Travis brings them up himself. I think part of that is as you guys look at it, and you know, Julie is the exception to this, I don't know that you've ever really have been in a classroom. Now, I know you go for the, for the show, and anybody that knows, when you go in for an observation, kids act on their best behavior, and we often get the, the classes. Have any of you ever taken the CBAS? Want to be a sub for a day? See what a real class is like when you're in there without the teacher? To see what teachers put up with? Because I think that gives you a perspective. It's very odd. You would think in like this was a hospital, you'd have doctors making decisions because they know what it's like when you've got somebody in an emergency situation or whatever. I think you appreciate teachers more when you find out it's not the integrated math class. That class will teach itself. It's the regular class with the kids who just had lost their puppy that morning, the mom who dropped the kid off without his breakfast. It's just weird craziness with hormones flying all over the place and you're trying to manage 36 cats. That perspective would make these processes much easier from both sides. One, it gives you a perspective of what teachers are actually dealing with. Two, it gives teachers a lot more trust in you. We had this discussion last time or comments last time that why are teachers afraid to come talk to you guys? Because they don't trust you. They, have been told that they're servants, they're cogs in a machine, they're the least important part of this process. Showing them that they aren't because you actually stepped in there one day. See a third grade class, which is way different than a seventh grade class, which is way different than an 11th grade class. Those things are important, those perspectives to build community are important to see that you're willing to take a day off and go see what that's like. Matter of fact, you guys need subs, you can actually get paid, so you're not actually taking a day off. You can go get paid to be a sub for a day, filling one of you know, Dr. Stock's problems of having subs on campus. But we can have that community aspect. We should be bringing more of the community onto campus, see what kids are actually like. See what the swearing is like. See what has happened since the pandemic. You have the SAEL things coming up here in the next agenda item. See what kids have become with so much influence of you can do anything you want because we'll just yell and scream as opposed to you need to be a cooperative person in the student, or sorry, a cooperative student in the classroom. So before I do that, I want to say also, Anna, again, great job. My ASB president is like, totally wants to be your little mentee. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve Rockland Teacher Professional Association tentative agreement and proposed salary schedules? So moved. Moved by, moved by Rochelle. Second by Tiffany. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Anna Fishburn. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Tiffany Stathoff? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Right. Item 9.3, action on 2021-2022 initial contract proposal from California Public School Employees, CSEA, and holding public hearing. Tony Limoges, right back at you. So a couple parts just to, to highlight that a Rockwood Unified School District has two uh, bargaining units or labor unions that they ne directly negotiate. We just concluded negotiations that I shared with you on Rockland uh, RTPA. Our other unit that we directly negotiate is with our CSEA chapter. Um, I have to give a major shout out to um, uh, Chuck and his team for really turning around a sunshine proposal. And tonight, that's what I'm presenting to you both 9-3 and 9-4 are from uh, CSEA and the district perspective. So CSEA is formally requested or sunshine, and that's the term, is proposal for negotiations for the 21-22 contract year. District staff and CSEA leadership present the attached agreement as a proposal for acceptance by the Board of Trustees for the 2021-2022 contract year. If this proposal is accepted, staff recommends directly following that the Board of Trustees hold a public hearing to accept comments from the public regarding the California School Employees Association and Rockland Unified School District's 21-22 initial contract proposals. Negotiations will begin following the public hearing. So right now I'm recommending a motion to take action on the CSA initial contract proposal for the 21-22 school year and to hold a public hearing. Do we have any board comments or questions? Open the, we will now open a public hearing regarding the public for public comment on 2021-22 initial contract proposal for California Public School employees. Are there any public comments? Right. Seeing none, we will now close the public hearing. Is there a motion to approve 21-22 initial contract proposal for California Public School employees, CSEA? So moved. Moved by Julie. Second by Rick. 
Brenda, will you please call the roll? Anna Fishburn? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Tiffany Sathoff? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Now item 9.4, action on Rockland Unified School District's 21-22 initial contract proposal to California School Employees Association and hold a public hearing. So item 9.4 is the other half of the Sunshine <laughs> proposal. The process is CSEA would first sunshine their proposal and then the district would sunshine their proposal. So the Rockland Unified School District annually presents its proposal for negotiations with CSEA for the next school year. For the approval of the Board of Trustees, the district is now preventing to the Board of Trustees for approval its proposal to the California CSEA for the 21-22 school year. If the proposal is approved, it is recommended that a public hearing be set for November 17th following the approval. If the proposal is approved, the Board of Trustees are to hold a public hearing to accept comments from the public regarding CSEA and RUSD's 21-22 initial contract proposals. Negotiations will begin following the public hearing not directly following, but shortly thereafter. So I'm recommending a motion to take action on the 2122 district's proposal for negotiations with CSEA and hold a public hearing. Any board comments or questions? All right. We will now open a public hearing for public comment regarding Rockland Unified School District's 2122 initial contract proposal for California School Employees Association. Are there any public comment? Right. Seeing none. We will now close the public hearing. Is there a motion to approve Rockland Unified School District's 21-22 initial contract proposal to CSEA? So moved. moved by Rochelle. Second. Second by Tiffany. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Anna Fishburn? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Tiffany Sathoff? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Tony, you got a Back up. So now to item 9.5, approved the revisions to the extra tonight. assignment salary schedule. <laughs> so as we just heard, and it's not an issue that's just exclusive to Rockland. My, my understanding and work with human resources across the Sacramento metro area, uh, Placer County and the state, we're all experiencing an issue with substitutes and kind of the, the, the scarcity of during this time of getting people in. We've surveyed and found a variance of reasons of why, and I will share with you, our pool of substitutes for our district this size is very large, but the amount that are currently actually working. Uh, we also met beginning of the school year with our area um, uh, human resources departments and kind of came to some agreements on what we were going to pay so it wasn't the great land grab. However, we've all run into this issue where we haven't got enough and we have Principals uh, supervising, um, they're going into classrooms frequently, uh, spending their days um, substitute teaching. We have teachers, I mean, that are losing their preps. And so, you know, in, in evaluating some different processes, I'm going to share with you what we did. So I apologize for that diatribe, but I think that helps the public at home because I tend to read off the script after that. In the past years, uh, what we have is the district provides substitute teachers for all certificated staff when absent from a classroom for a variety of reasons. Our USD teachers using preparation coverage time have been filling positions as needed. The daily rate for substitute teachers is 130 per day, and the long-term rate is a 203 a day. And the teacher preparation cover, coverage, so when uh, one of the RTPA members or, and or a certified teacher covers during their prep, they are paid $37.62 for the hour. So based on this experience, um, what we've done is we've, in order to be competitive, to entice uh, certificated teachers along with retired teachers to serve as substitutes in the district, both day to day and long term, we're proposing increases to the substitute level one rate, the hourly rate for teacher preparation coven coverage, an addition of a pay rate scheduled for retired certificated substitutes on the extra assignment salary schedule serving in long term assignments, if appropriately credentialed, we want to put ourselves in the best position to make it fiscally sound for a retired teacher. And I'll give you an example. Nothing worse than having a foreign language class um, being a, have a long term that maybe doesn't speak French. So hopefully this gives us the opportunity to find someone who's credentialed in that area that is retired um, that would be willing to do on a leave basis or for long term over 21 days. All increases except for the retired certificated long term substitute. So that's the long term one I just mentioned to you all the other situations or to help get us through the pandemic in hopes that after the pandemic, 
our large pool will be more willing to serve in the schools that we have. So this will be exclusively for the 21-22 school year other than the long term. In addition, a 4% increase will be added to the numbers 3, 4, and 7 on the extra assignment salary schedule upon board approval of the tentative agreement, which has already occurred. Our practice is, even though the extra assignment schedule is, is not necessarily inside of the contract, we as a practice apply uh, the same increase to those subsections, which are also uh, financed to RTPA members. With long ado, I'm recommending a motion to take action on the revisions as listed on the extra assignment salary schedule effective op October 26, 2021. I'm available for any questions if we got lost. So I just want to say I, I appreciate this and I fully uh, support this. This has kind of been our nightmare for since the beginning of the pandemic. We were concerned about this and it's ironically sort of coming more true now than ever. But I do think it's important to recognize the impact it has on the system. The amount of time that we're not able to do professional development, the amount of time we're not, that our administrators are not able to lead classroom instruction because they are in the classrooms teaching. The angst that's put on our teachers, knowing if they leave, if they're sick, if they don't feel well, that they may or may not seem to cover their class. So it has huge implications throughout our system. And so this is unfortunately, um, I hope, and th there's, a, there's sort of everyone's doing this, and there's a thing to say, I think what we have is we have to be competitive from a salary perspective or from a, a, a per hour perspective, but then also offer the great things Rockland has. So I think that gives us a competitive advantage. I hope this sort of steps us up in that thing is we do need to grow that pool because it's sort of uh, barely hanging on as it is now. So I appreciate that, Tony. And Trustee Miller, if I may add something to that that's not necessarily a part of what you're voting on is kind of a, to our previous discussion. We're also in the process of creating a calendar for district office certificated uh, personnel with teaching credentials from the superintendent on down to our instructional coaches that will also be used on a like a call basis. We won't have them bought beepers yet or anything to be able to also help with substituting in this shortage. So that will be coming out probably in the next week, but that's also- I, I think that's great and I deeply appreciate it. Deeply appreciate all of us are spending time in our classrooms, but I also understand that there's a job that everyone's doing and when they're not doing their job in the classroom, not, we're suffering from what we're trying to deliver for kids. So it has implications, but I really appreciate that organization. I will assure you sometimes being in the classroom with kids is more fun than my job. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Is there a motion to approve revisions to the extra s assignment salary schedule? So moved. Moved by Rick. Second by Rochelle. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Anna Fishburn? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Tiffany Sathoff? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. All right. Item 9.6. Um, approve elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund uh, expenditure plan. Hannah Anderson. Thank you. Good evening, President Counter, uh, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Districts that receive elementary and secondary school relief funds, in this case SR3, are required to develop a plan for how these funds will be used to address students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, as well as the opportunity gaps that existed before and were made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our USD staff has engaged in stakeholder groups or has engaged our stakeholder groups over the past 19 months, including the Board of Education, parents, students, and staff to create a plan that meets the needs of our RUSD students. Specific actions in the SR3 expenditure plan are related back to previous goals and actions in the LCAP, the Expanded Learning Opportunity Grant Plan, and the Learning Continu Continuity and Attendance Plan. There has been a lot of plans over the last year. <clears throat> The board has previously received updates at board meetings, study sessions, and various memorandum on the use of this funding. This is essentially a compliance document at the end of all of this planning processes. The plan must be adopted by trustees uh, with the associated ESSER 3 budget and subsequently submitted to the Placer County Office of Education for approval. Tonight, staff is asking for your approval of the ESSER 3 expenditure plan, and I am happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. I just want to thank you for this. I, I, I'm going to say the same thing you hear me say every single time, which is I cannot stand bureaucracy and I cannot stand compliance for compliance sake. 
and we have to do this to comply, but actually it feels like within the bones of it, there's actually an opportunity for real learning in this. I actually love the fact that we break out the dollars per area, and that gives us a chance to sort of see the impact we're having, the metrics behind it. It's a great opportunity for a dashboard to actually check and see. So when we have these hard decisions coming forward about what we're going to fund, we actually can learn from where we invested these dollars and whether they have the impact we wanted them to have. And so I actually think this is actually a great document and gives us an opportunity to actually move forward with it. So thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you for keeping us informed all throughout this. That's, you know, really helpful. So thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. Questions? All right. Thank you, H Hannah. I do have a uh, I do have one comment. So, um, Kurt Weidman, Weidman, if you can come up, please state your full name, city you live in, and the school your children attend. Hi, um, Superintendent Stock, uh, President, Board President, and Board Members. Um, my name is Kurt Weidman. Uh, I have a student in Valley View, and I live in Rockland. Uh, I guess I would urge the, the board to vote against this at this point because just reading through the plan, it, uh, from the last meeting, we talked about learning recovery, and, uh, and I don't know whether this is a response. It sounds like just a compliance thing that you do, but it, it has the, the amounts of dollars spent on that. It looks like uh, federal funds, maybe one-time money, but it does not talk about, it seems incomplete, because it doesn't talk about which school years this is going to be spent in. And I questions about, it looks like about 16% is spent on a director. Um, and I'm not sure, it's about three quarters of a million dollars. And so if that's in one school year, that's probably too much. If, if it's over 10 school years, it's probably too little. So uh, that's where I think the time-based information in the plan, I think maybe it should be brought back to the board with actually uh, a plan that has time in, in, in that with along with the money. Um, so I would think that that's something that needs to be taken a look at. So I, you know, I, I don't know, it's your, your decision either way, but it um, doesn't seem like it's complete. So thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund SR3 expenditure? Oh. If you can come up real quick, sorry. I think just uh, in light of information brought forward, uh, just a point of clarification, I want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. I know it's an 18-page document you sent to us. Um, I sat down, went over it. I actually had an opportunity to ask several questions I had because I did have many, and I, I got answers to them. Um, but I, I would want to get clarification. I was reading, I believe it was page 3. Um, could you confirm for me that this is a multi-year plan, not a one-year plan? This is a multi-year plan. Uh, there are a number of actions in this plan that are three-year actions. We do have three years to expense these funds. Okay, so this is a, so when I'm reading 2021 through 2024, that's accurate. So when I see these amounts, that's actually spread over three years? Correct. Is there a motion to approve the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund ESSER three expenditure plan? So moved. Moved by Julie, second by Rick. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say na no. Motion passes. Right. Right. Now to information item 10.1, learning recovery, social emotional learning. Anna Anderson, Director of School Programs, Accountability, and Associate Superintendent, Mr. McDonald. Good evening again, President Counter, Trustees, Superintendent Stock. It is my pleasure uh, to present um, to you on LCAP Goal 2, Social Emotional Learning, um, along with Dr. McDonald on behalf of Beth Davidson. Um, she unfortunately can't be here tonight, but like great teammates on any great team, um, we are filling in for each other and supporting each other um, <clears throat> as we get through this school year. So um, it is our pleasure to, to bring uh, this information to you this evening. 
Throughout the presentation, you'll be hearing about um, how this connects, how this work connects to our RUSD priorities, our alignment to the strategic plan and the LCAP that was approved in June, the process for selecting curriculum, a, a review of the curriculum, and an um, information about um, training that was just held in upcoming training this school year. As you know, our work in social emotional learning is aligned to uh, two of our current strategic plan goals and most specifically um, is aligned to LCAP goal three, uh, which was approved uh, in June uh, after a stakeholder engagement process and a development process last spring. As we engage in this work, we believe that it is important that we share a common understanding of what we mean by social emotional learning. Castle defines social emotional learning as the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. Uh, Castle emphasizes five domains responsible decision-making, relationship skills, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness. They emphasize these domains, and all of this is a partnership uh, between schools, our families, and our greater community. So when we try to think about why do we implement SEL, why is it important for social-emotional learning and social-emotional well-being to be brought into our schools? We know that by uh, bringing this to our students, we will increase positive outcomes for them. And we will decrease potential risks for them, suspensions, distress, et cetera. <clears throat> Last spring, uh, our parents and guardians and our parent advisory committee of our LCAP, as well as our staff advisory committee on our LCAP and our district administrators, engaged in a root cause analysis and uh, dove deeply into why this is a need of our students. What is causing this need for our students? And then they identified what are some potential ways that we could improve um, in this area? What would be those greatest areas of influence that would support our students? Through that, um, a team um, actually looked at this and identified that main root cause, or one of the root causes, as being a, a student skill deficit. Right, that students didn't have all the skills that they needed to display those five um, areas of responsible decision making and, re um, and self-awareness and self-management, that they needed more skills, more tools in their tool bag. And <clears throat> so a team determined that um, in order to fill that need, an SEL curriculum would be one of those ways that we could move forward and provide our students the necessary skills um, to interact with their peers at school and in life. Uh, after um, the LCAP work was completed, another team came together to look at, um, and this uh, team also consisted um, of teachers, our mental health therapists, our counselors, our parents, and our administrators coming together to think about uh, what uh, would a curriculum look like, what would it need to have, and what would be those components that we would want to meet. Um, and you're going to hear about the uh, selection of the curriculum in a little bit. Just as uh, Beth has actually brought to you um, over a, a series of uh, board meetings and workshops um, on math, we are providing trustees with baseline data this fall um, so that as we do this work of implementing the uh, various LCAP goals and the learning recovery work, we're showing you where we're starting and then we'll be coming back to you throughout the year to show you the progress that we're making um, and the outcomes um, that we're getting with students along the way. So the baseline data we will review uh, this evening will look at uh, our California Healthy Kids survey data, which you have seen previously, three-year, uh, four-year suspension data, three-year chronic absenteeism data, and uh, we are also going to be piloting a social emotional screener. It's important to us that we understand um, with, with the screener, we wanna start small because we truly do wanna understand the implications for students and staff um, before we roll a screener out um, in the whole district. We actually are uh, currently starting at two schools. We do have uh, cobblestone um, intermediate students participating in a screener as well as our Victory High School students. 
uh, our California Healthy Kids survey data, um, which you engaged with last spring, and we actually had our students at our high schools engage with as well, um, this shows us and continues to show us that all of our students have a need in the area of social emotional learning. And, and, and we, there are gaps there, and we have talked about those gaps previously where certain students are experiencing school differently. What I wanna highlight here um, is that all of our students are expressing a need here. And this year we are continuing to see um, a need and our administrators and teachers are reporting increased uh, stress, anxiety, and behavior in the classroom and out on the playground. This data was also shared in the LCAP development process. Um, this comes from our partners in Wellness Together who provide uh, school-based therapy for, our, um, for referred students um, on our campuses. The top two reasons for referral at elementary and secondary last year were sadness and worry and anxiety. At the elementary level, we also had emotional regulation and relationships uh, as top reasons for referral. And at the secondary, we also had major life transitions and relationships for top reasons for referral. This, this pattern continues in this school year. We're seeing relationships at the elementary level so far this year being that top reason for referral. And relationships at the elementary level, we're talking about social peer interaction. And then the, at the high school level, or the, I'm sorry, middle and high school level, we're seeing worry and anxiety continue to be that number one reason for referral. So as I shared previously, we will continue to uh, update the board on referral data this school year for not only our school-based therapy, but also our social work specialist referrals. We will bring that back at a future meeting. As, uh, as shared, we definitely see a strong correlation here between the indicators on our California Healthy Kids and the reasons for referral to that castle wheel, talking about those relationship skills, the self-management skills, the social awareness. The next couple of slides look at our suspension data. This first one um, shows four years of suspension data for off-campus and on-campus suspensions. I actually am going to move into the next one because I think it tells a, a broader picture. If you look at the left uh, slide here, this is showing four years of suspension data. So you can see the last school year where, and this is um, both in-school and out-of-school suspensions combined. And so if you look at the far left blue column, you see what our suspension rate, rate of suspension was uh, prior, to the, uh, prior to the pandemic. And then in 1920 school year, you can see that there was a significant uh, reduction. And there was a number of different um, uh, implementations that happened. We had at the secondary level been um, implementing more in terms of restorative practices in our, in our elementary and middle school level. We also had um, PBIS reaching a, a more of a sustainability um, level uh, in those schools. What you see with the lighter bars that are of the same color is um, the attempt to say, what would the suspension rate have been if we were to project it for a longer school year? So in the red bar, you can see in 1920, that's 128 days of school, and then school was shut down. And so if we had been suspending at the same rate, right, and this is um, at the same rate of suspension that we had all year, and we had 180 days of school, we can assume we would have had that um, projected rate of suspension. What I can also tell you is that historically, springtime leads to some additional suspensions. That is not factored in here, okay? This is just a straight, at 128 days we had this, I can extrapolate that to say at 180 days we would have had 2.17. And so in 2021, last school year, you can see there was a significant reduction in suspensions. Um, we saw that and that was um, true, uh, true across the district that rates of behavior, um, and I actually believe Trustee Hupp shared too in her district, rates of behavior were just lower you know, across the board um, where students were back to school in smaller groups and just happy to be there and there was a honeymoon period. Um, and then in 21-22, we are seeing increased rates of behavior. This is being um, called out by, um, definitely by our students um, in that they are expressing kind of a lack of control 
over their impulses. Teachers have said, you know, gosh, these students feel like they're two years younger than uh, the typical age that I'm used to, or behavior I'm used to seeing in my classroom. So teachers are seeing an increased rate of the need for uh, those classroom management skills. And then site administrators are definitely seeing an increased rate, but also an increased severity in the types of behaviors that they're seeing. So prior, um, before moving on from here, I just truly do want to emphasize um, this data was all collected through a new data system that we are launching um, in uh, a, a company called Illuminate, and uh, EduClimber is the product. Um, we're very um, excited to be launching this after a period of not having um, a data collection system that wasn't really um, through queries and, and um, Excel extrapolation. So um, just want to appreciate the board's insight into the need for this uh, data system to measure and monitor our, our students' areas of growth. It was by the click of a button instead of by the multiple hours of work that we were able to get this information. Moving into chronic absenteeism. So this shows three years of data. Absenteeism um, is looked at in a variety of ways uh, in the state of California, but one of the ways is to look at chronically absent students. Chronic absenteeism means students are absent for 10% of the school year or more for any reason. So this could be they're absent for excused absences or unexcused absences or truancies or anything, right? And so what that means in numbers is if there's 180 days in the school year, if students are absent for 18 uh, days or more, they would be considered chronically absent. So this target moves throughout the year. So at 120 days of the school year, if you're absent for 12 days of the year, you're considered chronically absent. So the reason that we look at this is that students who are missing at least 10% of the year are more at risk to be behind um, in, uh, in their academic skills. And then we know what comes along with students who are behind in their academic skills. It can lead to increased rates of behavior, increased rates of dropping out of school, um, and a variety of other risk factors. So we track chronic absenteeism. It's important to us. Um, it is one of our uh, metrics that we are tracking um, in goal two of the LCAP. And the last year we had the California State Dashboard, we were in the orange, right, in this area, indicating that we actually have an issue to address in this area. So there was slight progress made in 2019-20 at 7% chronic absenteeism. Um, again, it appears like there would have been progress last year um, in 2021. But I do want to also highlight last year in 2021, our attendance data was very interesting. Because if students were at home on, an, on a day, a, at home learning day, they were actually considered present. Right? If students needed to be quarantined, they were considered present. So the data from last year for attendance is very difficult to just look at and say, that number means that number. Right? So there's a lot of more nuanced information there. However, if we do say that number means that number, I don't think we should be OK that 690 students, roughly, were absent for over 10% of the school year, 690 students. So we still have work to do in this area, and there's reasons that are keeping kids out of school. So at this point in the presentation, we're going to move into the types of supports that we have to address these needs. Again, these are services you've seen previously. We continued services in the area of social, emotional, and behavioral um, in goal two of the LCAP. Um, specifically, we uh, are continuing uh, our counseling services, our behavior services, um, our our coordination of these services at the uh, district office and site level, the continuation of our school-based therapy program, the continuation of our equity um, integration into our PBIS work, the continuation of our foundational training, and uh, continuing to train our staff um, in all of these areas. We also expanded the services this year and are trialing a number of things um, with the one-time money that we receive from the state and federal government. So we have um, included four social workers this school year, two at the high school level, one in middle, and um, one at the elementary school level. We also have added additional aid time at the elementary school level to address the social, emotional, um, and behavioral needs um, to run social skills groups and support those students. We have uh, added, uh, will be adding those screeners. We've added additional school-based therapy time 
uh, at six of our high need sites. We've increased be behaviorist staff. We will be launching a family education series shortly. And then the last piece that we'll share with you more, and Dr. McDonald, I'm gonna invite him up, um, is to implement this screener. And again, that's to fill that need of that skill deficit to ensure that students have the tools in their tool belt to address everything that's coming their way. So with that, uh, Dr. McDonald, do you wanna talk about the curriculum? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Good evening, President Counter, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. It's an honor to be pinch hitting for my colleagues, Ms. Davidson and uh, Mr. Flowers this evening. I uh, will do my best to follow their great work. I also want to give a lot of credit to our program specialist, uh, Kylie Bray and Amanda Bannister, who did the lion's share of this work and ran the committees. Um, and we had, like Hannah said, we had uh, parents, teachers, administrators on this committee who did a ton of work vetting the curricula you're gonna see and that we're using in our schools, uh, making sure it was aligned with CASEL standards and flexible enough for our teachers to use in their classroom without disruption. Um, so without further ado, um, uh, actually one more thing. Um, I'm excited that this is the third leg of the MTSS tool. So we've been working hard on academics. We've been working hard on behavior through PBIS. We've been wanting to do something with social emotional learning to support our students. We know it's been a weak link. We put it in our learning recovery plan. We made it a priority this year. I appreciate the board making it a priority. And now it's coming to life. And I'll talk about the training that just happened two days ago. Very exciting stuff, um, very timely. Recently, American uh, Academy on Pediatrics declared a mental health crisis for students based on uh, many things uh, exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, as you heard Ms. Anderson tell you, talk to any teacher administrator right now, behavior, social emotional needs are off the charts. So we are in uncharted waters for students returning to school. Timing, this is a huge component of that support. Okay, now without further ado, uh, we, we're working with a company called um, Strong, uh, pur it's Purposeful People and Character Strong. Character Strong is the over overarching umbrella. Purposeful People is actually the K-5 component of this curriculum. It is a toolkit that combines character traits with social emotional learning, focuses on 10 characteristics, courage, kindness, respect, empathy, perseverance, responsibility, gratitude, cooperation, honesty, and creativity. They integrate this at four different levels. In the classroom, there's lesson pieces. For staff, there's challenges so staff can model this for students. For families, there is a family toolkit I'll, I'll show you where families can actually work on this, know what's happening, and help their kids learn this at home because we know that parents are the best first teacher. And then there's actually, I love this, implementation pieces for the playground. Students can go outside and do some of these things so they actually enact the things we're trying to teach. Um, so very powerful at elementary, really flexible. You can do it every day for 10 minutes. You can do it once a week for 30 minutes. Um, it's focused like a trade a month, like some of our character programs. So very familiar to teachers and very easy to do. Um, the family component I mentioned, there is a family newsletter that goes home for each trait. There's an explanation of what's happening about the curriculum. There's conversation starters, so you can have these conversations with their kids and questions you can ask. There's book lists and activities. There's like family challenges that you can do together to try to implement the traits. So well supported at home uh, and, and, and a great fit for this curriculum. At our secondary schools, uh, middle and high school have the actual character strong uh, curriculum. It's a little more structured, so this is more of a lesson based piece. It's designed to be implemented about 30 minutes a week, but there's definitely some flexibility within that program in terms of how you implement it and you can choose different traits or parts of the program. Um, there is, uh, at each level, there's a, a, a guiding question. So in middle school, you'll see the, the main sentiments are belonging, well-being, and engagement. This repeats in high school and adds leadership. Even though there's, there's a repeating theme, it's not the same lessons. They're all independent and build upon each other. Um, I like the guiding questions they use for belonging. How can we create a place where everyone belongs? Well-being, how do I cultivate well-being in my life and the lives of others? Engagement, what can I do to fully engage in my life now that prepares me for a meaningful life now and after high school? And finally, this leadership piece, which is like seniors in high school, how can we work to build a better world through personal influence and effective teamwork? Um, each session at that level um, has several different components. There's a welcoming component. There's a community building uh, component for the classroom. 
Uh, there's content or a lesson that's delivered to students. There's a character practice or skill building piece, and then a closing lesson. Um, one of the components that the trainers said is very popular and, 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 and kind of innovative, I feel, is that there's dares actually for students. So um, go out and do this thing this week. Write one sentence note to someone in your family telling them one thing you're grateful for about them. Leave it where someone can find it. So teachers, students at other schools who've adopted this have actually, it's not required, but they've named it as their favorite component. And again, I love this implementation piece that it's not just classroom learning, that there's an expectation and an option that you go out and do these things and live this way and do kind deeds and enact the character traits. Additional information, um, as schools implement these programs, a parent letter will be sent out. We do, as I mentioned before, and I know it's a board priority and we believe in it too. We want parents to be involved with these curricula, engage with their students. It's important um, that they do this together and they reinforce it at home. A letter will be sent home from each school site as they prepare the implementation with what's happening and when it's happening. There are website resources, so additional information can be found on the Character Strong website. Um, there's sample curriculum there. Uh, there's a scope and sequence there. In addition, if parents wish to preview the material or toolkits of the sessions, they can contact their site administrator and they can set up an appointment to go look at the curriculum and be walked through it. Uh, some important things that have happened. We actually rolled this out early to administrators. We want administrators to see it, think about it, think about how they're gonna work with their teacher leadership teams to implement it. So we had two different administrator trainings. This last Monday, we did district-wide staff training, a three-hour virtual training for elementary, middle, and high school. I sat in on elementary and middle school. Um, really good job. They did a great job. I've, I've unfortunately attended a lot of virtual trainings in the past 18 months. This was high level and excellent, very well received by our staff, and I think a really good start. Uh, there's gonna be another training we're gonna do for instructional aides to support this uh, and supervisors out on the playground. Um, and throughout the year, we're gonna have dedicated time for, for teams to implement this, plan around it. On our USD Learns Days, we're gonna have a SEL focus where we can dig a little deeper. We're gonna be looking for feedback from staff and teachers and administrators on how to improve. Um, and then our district leadership team will be bringing this forward as well to discuss and plan around. Um, that professional development I mentioned, here's the data we collected. Relevancy was about 94% of teachers felt like this was very relevant. Um, to what they're doing and, and what they need. Um, about 90% of teachers felt like it was, um, they agree and strongly agree that this addressed the needs they're seeing from students in their classroom and will be a good fit. So in both categories, over 90% of our teachers feel this was valuable. Finally, next steps, again, dedicated time to implement, uh, monitor the implementation, measure the impact with healthy kids survey and behavior data and absenteeism. You know, at elementary and middle schools, we actually have behavior data through Swiss. Um, like I said, right now it's escalated. Hopefully this will be one component where we start to see that drop off as, as we start to teach kids how to talk to each other and listen and self-regulate and all those things that are part of the curriculum. Um, and then as we go forward, we'll keep revising our LCAP goals and revise our actions. So thank you. All right, just ask for any board comments. Yeah, just, just, yeah, I guess real, real quick, and I'll go. Um, you, you made note that there were other schools that uh, have adopted or are working. So one question, are they local? And then if so, or if you've spoken with them, just their feedback, what are they, you know, what are the pros and cons? What are they like? What, if they could change something, what would they change? And, it, and if you got that feed, just curious what the feedback is. I know that the planning team did actually reach out to um, other school districts, and I am sure if Beth were here, she would be able to say specifically which school district, so I apologize that I don't have those names offhand. We can definitely get those for you. Um, but I do remember the feedback being uh, around the appreciation of the flexibility and appreciation of the communication tools inside of the program to help this truly be a partnership between home and school. Um, and then uh, I know that uh, at the elementary level, the feedback um, that the, the team that was making the selection appreciated was just the ability to integrate this with the existing work at, of PBIS that's already happening at the school to not make it like it's one new thing, but rather something that can be interwoven with what is going on at the school already. Am I right that Springview and Whitney High School have already started the Character Strong, and, what, and how are they feeling about it? So overall, um, 
we actually uh, had a great conversation with Mr. Cutts just to kind of hear from him what is going, uh, you know, what's going well at the school. And he said that overwhel overwhelmingly he's heard positive comments from students and um, positive comments from staff in their implementation. Um, he did say that initially he received some questions um, from families and truly this um, was a reinforcement to us that we need to communicate about and so using those tools in the program and communicating out. Um, Mr. Cutts did meet with some families early on and offered that the curriculum is there and available to be reviewed. Um, he did have um, a family take him up on that uh, review and they uh, had no questions after that point. So um, it, it just again reinforced enforce that need to message with families ahead of time that we want to be in this partnership with them. Again, positive comments from students and then they, now that they've been trialing it for a little while, um, they plan to send um, a survey out uh, to teachers and students um, and then they can adjust their implementation as they go. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the uh, recognizing, okay, we could do a little bit better on the communication with our families in the future and also uh, providing easy access for any families, you know, that are interested. Thank you. Uh, I, just, I have to say, I'm so excited about Illuminate. So it looks great. I, I love the predictive analytics. It looks great. I'm excited. Thank you. It's a huge step forward. Um, we're going to do a lot of good with that. That's awesome. So I also say that I do want to say in a series that I really appreciate both this conversation and our willingness to share data honestly. There's some data in here that's really, really concerning. There's some d d compelling data in here as well. But the fact that we're willing to disaggregate, talk about it, talk about where our gaps are, and put it out there publicly, and then have the conversation how we can get better, I think speaks volumes about the work you all are doing, and I appreciate it. I will say, like, things strike out, like, the absence this year is going to be insane. I worry about what that's going to mean down the road, especially next year. Um, also, optimism being so low across the board and getting worse. And so there are things that sort of jump out at you to think I'm, I'm looking forward to how you engage in this and move forward. And the final thing I want to say, Hannah, you actually raised this, so I appreciate you're always one step ahead of me, but I was going to say this, that same thing about weaving. So when, when this is brought forward as a curriculum, it immediately gets me concerned because the reality is we actually, there's pretty good research to say around SEL that standalone curriculums are not as valuable as, as building it into your current curriculum. So thinking about how we're not adding one more thing on teachers and not doing a separate, but how we think about embedding this into everything we're doing is gonna be a lot of work on you and on Beth and on the team. And we appreciate your leadership and, and all, uh, everyone's working to do this because the teachers are gonna have a lot of work and what we don't need to do is add another thing. We just need to give them another tool to be successful. Yes. Thanks, it's great. One more thought. Um, in 2017, when we worked on the district strategic plan, I was so impressed with the staff members that really recognize the need to help the whole child. That those kids that are struggling in these areas, the why behind us doing these kinds of things is, is that they're struggling with academics, yes, but we have so much more that we're concerned about that we really can help them with. So I appreciate uh, working to um, that goal. Thank you, I do have one public comment. So. Um, now invite Kirk Weidman, Kurt Weidman, sorry, to come forward to the podium to address the board for public comment on the agenda item. Please state your full name, city you live in, and the school your kids attend. Thank you. You nailed it on pronunciation this time. Thanks. Uh, Kurt Weidman, Valley View, Rockland. And uh, regarding, I, you know, uh, the last board meeting, there was a presentation on learning recovery and this is a huge part of it. I think, you know, with or without the data, I think everybody can say that the kids have been harmed by public policy. Uh, it didn't have, have to happen that way. Other states and other countries did not put this on their kids, so the people that are responsible for that are the adults in this room and the ones in Sacramento. So everybody needs to own that, and that will trickle down through the years. Um, the reason I mention that and, and, you know, they're doing good work, but I mean, it's a, it's like shooting yourself in the foot and then and congratulating yourself for sewing yourself up on the foot. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, just uh, some updates, uh, zero deaths from COVID under 18 in Placer County. 83% um, are over the age of 65 in most Teachers, I'm not sure what age they usually retire, but most of the cohort is below 65. 
Uh, so there's really no legitimate risk to students to continue to mask or force mandate uh, vaccines on it. <laughs> one, one, one of the outcomes is going to be, you know, people are going to go into homeschool. They're going to start up homeschool pods. They're going to go into uh, parochial schools or private schools. So you're going to have less money next time you're negotiating with the teachers. There'll be an impact. I think, I think the vaccine mandates are just gonna have more of a substantial impact than the actual COVID infections on this department, on this, on this here. I, you know, I just hope when everybody's got their stirs and their purrs and they've got their vacation homes, they're enjoying what they did in the last couple of years when they could actually make a difference. Um, so it's really sad. I mean, Placer County, there's unfortunately the 37 residents in hospital with COVID, that's down from 101 two months ago. And cases per thousand has dropped from basically 50 cases down to 16 per 100,000. So we're still sailing into this, uh, I got 35 seconds. Everybody in the hospital with COVID that has an infection is from the Delta variant. The vaccines were, were I got 26 seconds, were developed for the initial variant. So it's like getting last year's flu shot for this year's flu, it's not going to help. So, all right, thank you. So, I have another comment. Care, Carrie, I was yeah. So, Carrie, if you can come up, state your name, the school your ch ch children attend, and then the city you live in. Thanks. Uh, my name is Carrie Hamilton. Hi everyone, you know who I am. Um, I am got one at Whitney and one at Rukla. And I actually didn't know you were talking about Character Strong today. I was the family that went and looked at the curriculum. And I was the family who hounded Mr. Cutts with very little, like one email back. He was very unapproachable about the whole entire thing. If you actually go through Character Strong's website and you go through their blog, their main reference that they use is to, I can't remember the website, I was trying to look them up because I had this whole back and forth with cuts. One of their blog websites that they reference a lot is MLPP something. I can get it to you all later. I can find my past emails. But in that blog, they reference um, intergenerational uh, racism. They, and they talk about white supremacy, a whole gamut of critical race theory type stuff. I don't think that's what we're trying to get to our kids to help them socially emotional. The actual piece that they're showing at Whitney on the surface isn't harmful, but if you've been at Whitney, as I have been at Whitney for a while, and if you went through last year at Whitney, you would be on guard. The only reason my daughter is still going to the classes, they only do it, it's like once a week for, and it's half an hour. The video is like 10 minutes and then there's discussion amongst the class. There's um, discussion questions that they give the teachers. The teachers are leading the discussion. There are several teachers, and I've spoken up here about these same teachers before at Whitney that are very, I don't know how to describe it, but they would push the conversation into a very uncomfortable conversation for children to have, one that I wouldn't want my kid involved with. Knowing the teacher that she's at and the period that they are teaching this, I'm comfortable with it because I know that teacher would put a kibosh on anything that went that way. There are definitely teachers at Whitney that will not do that. So just as you guys look into this and know my perspective as a parent who I sat in the conference room at Whitney and we watched the whole thing, um, it's, that's my two cents. And I still have a minute left, but. Superintendent Stock, can you address that? Because I know as board members, we had several questions as we heard from parents, and I so appreciate the engagement. Thank you for going and um, listening and asking questions. It really does help all of us grow together. Can you address, though, what um, people may find versus what we at Rockland Unified are using? Um, yes, I mean, we, you know, I received several of the emails that, you know, said that the uh, website or, or links on the website uh, talked about different topics. The, the curriculum we, we purchased that, that was shown to the board, the, uh, the Character Strong and, and the elementary program and, and the um, 
purposeful people, thank you. Um, is, but neither of those, um, you know, those are, are curriculums that are, are widely used. They are, um, you know, uh, intentional on, on the outcomes we have. Um, our school district does not teach critical race theory. Um, that's taught in graduate schools, law schools. Uh, that is not in this curriculum. It was no intention to adopt uh, that. This is to serve the needs that was shared in the data to the board. And, and this is a curriculum that was chosen by our, uh, you know, involved uh, educators uh, making their professional recommendation on what the students need and how this best integrates into what we're doing. And so that was the reason this curriculum was chosen. And that's also why we want parents to take a look at it. We want parents to understand what topics are covered, when they're covered, what the approaches are. We invite parents to come in to their school and see the lessons. And, and that's something that we, we think is, is appropriate. It's something we did when we adopted social science in the district and to make sure that open, transparent communication is there so parents see what's being taught in their children's classes. And most importantly, I think even our, our, our comment I've alluded to, have the conversation about how that's being taught. If, if you as a parent are curious uh, with that principal, with that teacher, uh, reach out. Uh, the best thing we can do is have that communication around um, how are you teaching this? How is the discussion structured? And, and our board had a presentation this August on our sensitive topics policy, and we uh, have a very clear expectations, and we did district-wide training for all teachers on our sensitive topics policy this August. So there, there's, you know, we invite that dialogue, invite the conversation, uh, versus people have worries about what is it or how is it being taught. Reach out, engage, and, 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 and we want that collaboration and feedback. Thank you. Right. So we'll now open agenda item 11.1, .1, public comment on non-agenda items. I want to remind everyone that this agenda item is included to give anyone in attendance an opportunity to ask questions or discuss non-agenda items with the board. The board is not to pro permitted to deliberate or take action upon non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to staff members for a follow-up, a complaint about a specific employee of the district shall be made uh, shall be made to that employee's immediate supervisor or principal as required in administrative regulation uh, 1312.1. If you're here tonight planning to address the board on a non-agenda item, please fill out those green public comment cards. I got a stack of them so far, so excellent. Uh, cards may be filled out completely. I will call your name, step up to the podium. I'll let you know who's on deck. If you are that second person, if you can just stand up somewhere out in that middle area, we can move forward. Um, all public, item, all, all public comments must be addressed directly to the board. There's a three-minute time limit per person. We usually do 30 minutes, so we'll go three minutes for the first 10. After that 10, we'll go to one minute, and we'll go through these as fast as we can and as much time as we can. Uh, the comments must be respectful and professional. Please no profanity. Um, again, three minutes for the first 10. We'll go to a minute after. Um, there's countdown clocks up here on, on either side. Please address the board. And we'll start off Tawana Armstrong. And then behind Tawana Armstrong is Hope Struck. Hi, good evening, um, President, trustees, superintendent, and the administration over here. So I come before you today to talk to you about a couple of topics. One is the course of study, which um, I've now learned is electives, um, and more so with respect to the process of uh, those courses of study. Uh, Trustee Price and Trustee Sadoff, thank you so much for responding to my email that I sent to you about my concerns with the power grab that was made when it comes down to approving courses of study or slash electives. Um, specifically, I'm wanting to talk to you about ethnic studies and the need to make sure that um, those classes reflect the shared learning experiences of uh, when they're presented to you. Um, Trustee Sadoff, you made the comment that um, these should be discussed in public forum, and I can wholeheartedly agree with you. I would hope that I can count on you and Trustee Co Counter to make sure that questions get answered in a public forum about those electives, specifically ethnic studies, um, that, you pre that they are presented with the process of 
really delineated with respect to what does that process look like? What is it going to, uh, what does it take to make sure that uh, the, st the elective is presented before you and what steps are you going to take to approve now that you are the final arbiter? Um, those that come before you that have an element of equity and diversity, I would ask you to do your due diligence to spread your net far and wide, given the lack of dis diversity that uh, is up on the school board, that th those are voices that are, that are not being heard. So that process, as I understand it, begins in, in December, um, probably with the announcements or gathering of those electives, and then it will be presented in a public forum in January with the vote to be uh, in a second part process. I would just ask you to make sure, um, as I have reached out to you, to make sure that you are reaching out to those voices that you do not hear from. I know, please, everyone should remain respectful, but I ask you to take a look at that mom who is talking about her son or daughter who is repeatedly being called slurs um, I sat with a group of outstanding students, and they wholeheartedly said, yes, it's happening on the campuses, and I know there are racial incidents that are happening that are not being addressed. I implore you, I have worked with the district now because my daughter is a graduate who experienced some of those things, and I have worked with the district. If your behaviors do not match what you have shared with me, you are being disingenuous. All right, thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Hope Struck. And then behind Hope Struck, Courtney Weedman. Courtney Weedman, sorry. Weidman. Oh, my gosh. Go Hello. ahead. Hello. I have um, a comment I wanted to make about the school board supposedly being a nonpartisan entity, that when you sign up to run for election for the school board, you're not even allowed to write whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. And um, so I wrote this. Uh, my father is a pastor and a Vietnam veteran. He's a Marine. In college, he'd call me every November 10th at 6 in the morning to sing from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. It was a heck of a way to wake up with a hangover. <laughs> when he came home from the war, he dedicated his life to Christ and became a pastor and a pacifist. The first thing he did when he was called to serve at a church was to move the American flag out of the sanctuary. He did this because he understood that the separation of church and state was one of the freedoms that he fought for and that his friends died for. The first, <laughs> he taught me that protest was free speech and that I could love my country by demanding that we do better. I saw you, Tiffany, at the protest at the Capitol. And I saw you say that you make your decisions based on the Bible and the Constitution. And as someone who was raised in the church, I understand being prayerful and I understand making decisions based on your frame of reference. The First Amendment to the Constitution states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, the two parts known as the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, respectively, form the textual basis for the Supreme Court's interpretations of the separation of church and state. Basically, this is not a theocracy. That is why you are allowed to practice your religion, why I'm allowed to practice my religion, and why other people are allowed not to practice religion. Um, our veterans fought to preserve freedoms, and the separation of church and state is one of the foundations of our freedom. So you were exercising your right to protest, and I applaud you, and I applaud all the people who are showing up here to be heard, right? This is democracy, and I respect that. But my question is, are your religious and political convictions unfairly influencing our school board decisions? And I just really, I'd ask you to take a look at that. Um, for example, instead of getting ahead of this and looking at the mandates and saying, let's provide free testing right off the bat for the parents, the board was like, you know what, we don't like masks because of our political and religious affiliations. And we'd like to say that masks are optional. 
And so that was the most stressful way to start the school year for those of us who are trying to follow the law and the mandates. Respectfully, I just would like to ask you to really Thank watch you, that Stroke. carefully. Thank you, Ms. Strzok. <laughs> Courtney Weidman, followed by Josh Nagelman. Good evening, board. I, um, I just wanted to, to give you guys a little bit of encouragement in regards to the, uh, the mask mandate. And I've heard in the past from you and other boards that your hands are tied. So I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement here. Um, Lucerne Valley, California, the Lucerne Valley Unified School District, five member board of trustees unanimously voted on uh, last Thursday to take a stand against the mandatory COVID-19 vaccines for students and staff. The key point to their four page resolution included trustees belief in parental choice, the lack of legal authority to mandate COVID vaccines, the virus's ultra low risk to school aged children and constitutional protection for people. Also last week, Happy Valley School Board up near Redding, California, unanimously voted not to enforce the vaccine mandate for children as well as for their staff. Tim Garmer, the president of Happy Valley School Board said, and I quote, in order to make this successful, we need other schools to join us. So I would encourage you board to join, <laughs> to join these districts in giving medical choice to children and staff. Lastly, I wanna leave you with a quote that was put out by In-N-Out Burger recently. Yeah. <laughs> And it says, we refuse to become the vaccination police for any government. It is unreasonable, invasive, and unsafe to force associates to segregate customers into those who may be served and those who may not be served based on documentation they carry. All right, if, if In-N-Out Burger can take a stand on a, on a vaccine mandate and accurately show it for what it really is, you guys can too. Thank you. I'd like to invite Josh Nagelman up and then behind him, Kevin Cooper. Please restate your name, school yep. your kids attend, yep. all that How stuff, thank you. Doing? I, I, you guys probably remember me last time. My name's Josh Nagelman. I'm from Rockland, Whitney Oaks. My son goes to uh, Granite Oaks. And um, I talked a little bit about, you know, we have uh, a family member that was paralyzed waist down, 22 years old after her second shot. Um, my friend went in a coma for three weeks, learning to walk again. But here today, I'm here to talk about my teacher, or my son's teacher at Granite Oaks, Mrs. Reagan. I don't know if you're aware of her, but I apologize, but Mrs. Reagan, she um, shows the kids, CNN kids, all the time. She showed a video showing that the vaccine is FDA approved for 16 years of age and older, and soon to be approved for 12 years of age. And what did the kids think of that? And they got to write about it. I actually went, I, I wrote a, a note to her and then I also went and visited the principal I asked him about it and he said I didn't see anything wrong with it it said at the beginning it's not biased at all Look, I mean I'm just asking if it's all CNN why not why not listen to OAN or something you know and then the next thing is I asked him well what do you think is it really FDA approved he's like well yeah I think you know they're approved right they're FDA approved the principal of Granite Oaks doesn't even know these are emergency use authorization only shots. Not one shot available to the public is FDA approved. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The next thing I wanted to say is, you know, I think I, I understand you guys. I don't think you guys are the problem. It's the teachers from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing. And, you know, you guys have a big decision to make. You guys were all voted in by the people. So you have a decision whether you're gonna stand with the government or you're gonna stand with the people that put you in these places. Because I guarantee you, there's people getting hurt 
and it's people like me that are getting censored for it, for providing information on social media. I got all my accounts disabled. And, you know, if, if you guys push this vaccine, there's people that are out there working daily, and they have to get their kids to school because they have nobody to watch them. They may not look into these vaccines as much as I have, but I'll guarantee you if one of their children gets hurt after you guys mandate it just so they can send their kids, you better watch out. My kid already has a mask exemption for medical reasons, and if he's definitely not going to be getting the vaccine. But I'll tell you what, if one of these, kid, one of these parents' kids gets hurt or killed, and any of you guys voted for that, I'm just telling you, you can call the DOJ. I'm, don't worry about me. I would worry about mama and papa bear. And I think you guys should realize, you know, which side are you on? Thank you very much. Kevin, real quick. So I am a teacher and I work with teachers and I adore teachers and I want to be clear on a couple of things. Teachers are as different as everyone else. There are as many different opinions as there are teachers. So please let's be careful. And also we have a board policy that we must follow. We do not say teachers' names. If we have difficulty with a particular teacher, we need to take that up with that particular teacher, please. Mr. Mr. Cooper? Sir. Go ahead. Uh, you know Mr. the President, rules. Um, board, Mr. Stock, um, my name is Kevin Cooper. I live in town. Most of you guys know me. I'll try and get closer to the mic. Uh, it's good to see you guys. I know it's been a long year. Uh, God bless you for your efforts. Um, I'm thankful that you guys are serving. I know it's a heavy load. Um, so recently... Okay. Recently, I, I did a little bit of research and uh, shared a letter with the health leaders at Sutter, Kaiser, and uh, with the county supervisors. I'll pass it off to you, and I'll probably just write another letter uh, and send it to you guys, because I was amazed that there are 340 teachers that are going to choose to take a test rather than get the vaccine, and I think we need to put a framework around that. And part of that framework is that right now there's four vaccines. Three of them, as that gentleman mentioned, are part of an emergency use authorization, and they have a shield against product liability. Some of you guys don't know this, but I teach out an MBA program. That's a pretty nasty thing to ask someone to take a product that's got a liability shield. Um, the one that supposedly doesn't have a liability shield is this thing called comernity. I'll just share with you what I wrote because I actually did this so I can attest to it. So um, I believe the community has lots of concerns because we don't really know what's going on with the vaccines. And the assertion I made to the regional president of Kaiser, the CEO of Kaiser, and the board, and I'll probably send something like this to you, is that you guys owe us an explanation on these things before you're going to do it. Gavin Newsom's in Sacramento. We've been in lawsuits every year since I've lived in here for 20 years over nurses and IEPs. We can afford some money to sue somebody and block this. We'll fight with you. But the reason that we want this to kind of slow down, guys, is because nobody knows. Nobody's talking to us. It's, nobody's come out and said, hey, this is what these emergency use authorizations mean. And then when I called Kaiser and said, hey, can I get Comirnaty? They told me, don't worry about it. Comirnaty is the same as the vaccine we're giving you. I said, no, no, I want a box with Comirnaty on it. And they said, we don't know if we have one. So then I called Pfizer, and they said, we don't know if you have Comirnaty in your area. Now, I know that if I want a Tesla, I go down the street and I call that guy and I want that Tesla, they'll tell me it's there and they'll tell me the prices and then I won't buy it. But the important point is, is that you guys are leaders and we have a right to ask you on our behalf to say, hey, let's break this down. Let's talk about this. Now I know there's a group of people that are working at Jessup, God bless them, they'll be able to hopefully put something together, but y'all can't make this decision without a public statement that says this is how all the vaccines work and why. And so, because um, I don't think any of us are going to take a vaccine if we don't understand it. And so I would just ask you guys as leaders to take a look at that. And my three minutes is up. I will leave this. I have a set for each of you. 
It's basically the letter I wrote to everybody else. There. I'll deal with her, right. and then I'll try and follow something up. Right. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Oh. Allegra Stratton. And then after Allegra Stratton, Mike Murray. My name's Allegra Stratton. I am an information technology partner serving state and local government and education in California for over 15 years. I'm an eight-year resident of Placer County and an active, um, actively involved in my community coaching seven to nine-year-old youth cheerleading. All three of my daughters attend school actually in Western Placer Unified School District, ranging in ages from five to 14 years old. Last night, our district approved a resolution to support local decision-making authority to request modifications to the governor's vaccine mandate and have agreed to send a letter to, this, um, to the governor um, the, um, agreeing with that. Our superintendent also agreed to begin discussions with other local school districts in the county. And so I am here to lend a hand and to ask the board of Rockland Unified School District to take a proactive approach in collaborating with the other county school districts, uh, school districts in the county. According to the CDC, the definition of a vaccine is a preparation that is used to simulate the body's immune system against disease. The Oxford language definition for a vaccine is a substance used to stimulate the body production of antibodies and provide immunity against a disease. As of October 15th, Placer County had 42 COVID patient hospitalizations. Seven of those 42 patients are fully vaccinated. Governor Newsom is forcing a therapeutic shot on the um, unprotected to protect the protected from, anyway, next. <laughs> not giving the parents a choice and forcing families to inject our children with a synthetic drug that does not prevent the contraction or transmission of the COVID-19. Also, it also lacks years of research, statistics, and data is not the answer to this so-called pandemic. Placer County is not in a state of emergency. In fact, our mental health of our children is more of an emergency than COVID-19. 95% of all COVID deaths occurred in persons with four more comorbidities, all of which are preventable diseases. The chance of a five to 17 year old getting severe COVID is 0.051. A five to 17 year old at, has a 0.0061 of dying of COVID. What's more interesting is that the death rate of the vaccine for five to 17 year olds is actually 0.00217, which is not much of a difference. And I don't think is, um, required for a mandate. Governor Newsom has asked the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to remove the vaccine mandate for the California Correctional Peace Officers. As much as I've done uh, digging through articles, I've not been able to find a reason why this favorable exemption is being requested. I can tell you that the CCPOA union donated $1.75 million to the Governor Newsom's recall election. So that got me thinking, what if all of our parents that are opposed to the vaccine Thank actually Thank you, Mr. contributed Adam. to legal representation? Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Mike Murray, and then Leslie Jamison. Hi, I'm Mike Murray, uh, kids at Cobblestone. I uh, live here in Rockland. I came here tonight to thank the board. Uh, what you guys have put up with the last 18 months has just been amazing. Um, <laughs> Not only have you made the right decisions for our kids, but you've also shown the courage to stand up to bullies. The bullies in our community are a small and loud group. This fringe extremist group comes in here calling names, judging you based on your skin color, judging you based on your religion, judging you based on your morals and beliefs. Simply, they're judging you simply because you won't cave to their progressive will. And let's be clear on what they're trying to do. They want you so emotionally hurt that you step down. Their intent is to create an illusion of divisiveness in our community. From the majority of our community, we thank you for holding your ground and doing what is right for our kids. One person in this fringe group came here last meeting, used a fake name, and spoke out a turn on an agenda item. She called you guys names. It was disgusting. And what was even more disgusting was the teachers union cheered her on as she slandered your good names. This is the same teachers union that the union boss put out an email in summer 2020 asking the teachers to lie about pre-existing conditions. This is the same teachers union that spread paranoia about the kids returning the fall to, in 2020 to an AB schedule. You followed the science and the math, you got our kids back on campus. 
you did what was right for our kids. <laughs> then, then when hybrid learning was inadequate, in large part due to the teachers union refusing to allow classroom, or cameras in the classrooms during the AB schedule, you moved forward to an AM PM schedule, getting kids on campus every single day. That was the right thing to do, and that was against the union once again. Thank you. When you pushed forward to the return to full-time school, the union boss again came with a bunch of nonsense about kids dying from COVID. We heard the numbers. Once again, you followed the science and the math, and you made the right decision for our kids. You've done the right thing all the way through this, and we thank you for it. And to be clear, we love our teachers. This is not against the teachers. This is against teachers union and a union boss that is not acting ethically. Time after time, you've done the right thing despite pushback and bullying from parties whose priorities really aren't kids first. Last meeting, you decided to hold checks and balances over taxpayer-funded elective classes. Again, this was the right thing to do for kids and for taxpayers. It's ludicrous to think that teachers should be able to have the creative freedom to teach whatever electives they want with no oversight. Not only would a teacher teach an elective be pulled out of a course subject, but it could take the student away from a more beneficial subject or elective. If the teacher's creative freedom had them teaching the history of Harry Potter on the taxpayer's dime, of course there should be oversight from the board. It's ludicrous to think that it shouldn't. We elected you to do what's right for our kids and you have not, been, you have not disappointed. Despite the name calling and bullying, you've stood your ground and done what's right. From myself and the thank majority you. of the community, we thank you and we have faith that you'll continue doing the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Murray. <laughs> Leslie Jameson and then Travis Wyckoff behind Leslie. Name, where you Hi, live, my school. name is Leslie Jamison. I have four kids there at John Adams um, Roseville uh, Academy. And I am the Sacramento chapter leader for an organization called FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I am speaking tonight in regards to the ethnic studies course that is now going to be required for all incoming 2025 freshmen. I've extensively studied the California Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum, or ESMC. It is problematic and imbalanced. It focuses on power and oppression, oppression related to race. When Dr. Clarence Jones, a speechwriter and advisor to MLK, read through it, he wrote a letter saying, I write this letter to you in great dismay and great concern for the perversion of history that is being perpetuated by the California Ethnic Studies model curriculum. If this model curriculum is approved, it will inflict great harm on millions of students in our state, close quote. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. and his role in the civil rights movement is not covered in the ESMC because, because he is considered too much of a docile figure. What's important to understand is that people who oppose this curriculum are not saying we should not have ethnic studies. They see the imbalance and slanted partisan ideology of it and want to provide a more complete picture. FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, is providing that compelling alternative. The FAIR curriculum exposes students to histories, experiences, struggles, accomplishments, and contributions of Americans of diverse backgrounds. It is fact-based approach to teaching students about racism. It's honest about the failures and shortcomings of our American past and present while recognizing how the struggles and accomplishments of Americans continue to move us closer to our ideals. Students learn to counter racism and intolerance with humanity and compassion. FAIR developed its curriculum to empower students to confront racism and bigotry, which depend on a dehumanizing emphasis on racial difference. In contrast to curricular that view America through a triumphal or cynical lens, FAIR presents an honest account of the past and present, teaching students to think for themselves by engaging deeply with original sources, multiple perspectives, and opposing viewpoints on important events. It teaches historic and a contemporary racism, racism while inspiring students to feel that their voices and actions count. The curriculum emphasizes the dignity and worth of each person because of our common humanity. The curriculum also meets the California legal requirements for an ethnic studies curriculum. FAIR is a national organization with an impressive, diverse board of advisors, politically and racially. It is committed to being nonpartisan and focused on our common humanity. As far as implementing the curriculum, FAIR, alongside with a California-based group called ACES, the Alliance for Constructive Ethnic Studies, can provide teacher and parent workshops and training. Roseville Joint and John Adam Ac Academies are already taking steps to um, consider it. The FAIR curriculum is directed at the 70 to 80 percent of us in the middle who want to move forward with humanity and realistic but hopeful optimism. There are some people who may want to stay, their, stay in their corners and not support it, and that's okay. I would highly encourage Rockland to consider the FAIR curriculum in order to represent your constituents in the best way possible. It is balanced, it is constructive, it does not gloss over, but it focuses on our common humanity. Um, and I have information that I'm gonna leave if you'd like to know more. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jameson.
uh, Travis Wyckoff, and then Michael Ayala. Good evening. My name is Travis Wyckoff. I'm a resident of Roseville. And I don't have any children yet, but I have a baby boy to be born in January. I'm a product of the Rockland Unified School District. I graduated Whitney High School in 2009. And since then, I've gone on to my career and, and some other things. But I, I put a lot of thought into what I wanted to come and say tonight. And I've listened to a lot of things that I agree with, some that I don't agree with. And I think that's a, a wonderful forum to experience firsthand. It's my first time attending a meeting like this in public. And I guess the most important thing that I can think of saying is I hope that as I look forward to the future of the education in the Rockland Unified School District, it accurately represents what I personally experienced as I went through it. It was a good experience. It was a good education. I made a lot of friends. I made a lot of good connections with teachers and professionals that have impacted my life and became mentors. And I want to see that opportunity to be available for my children in the future. And it's of great concern as I hear of a lot of big issues circulating throughout different media outlets and, of course, that we hear talked about tonight. I suppose the only other thing that of, of importance that I could say is thank you. And specifically, you four have, have mentioned your stances, and I respect them, and you have my support. I can't imagine the amount of grievances and, and upset people that you face on a daily basis that perhaps might be nasty or inappropriate in their behavior towards you, but you're not alone. I am here tonight. There are many others here tonight that share your views, and I appreciate that you're taking a stand on those views. To insinuate that you are supposed to compartmentalize your personalities, political beliefs, religious influence and personal morals away from your career and duties as a leader in this community and unified school district, I think is ridiculous. So please be who you are because we selected you for these positions because of who you are and how you behave. Be true to yourself and you'll continue to be true to us. And we'll look forward to a good educational future for the upcoming members of our society and our city. Because that's what it's about not letting the culture we enjoy, the city we enjoy, the education we enjoy be subverted by radical ideology that segregates people into certain camps and, and creates more hostility and less of a community. Thank you. Michael Ayala. And your number 10 after you is Millie Yan, and then we'll go down after with Millie and then Holly, and it'll be one minute comments with Millie and beyond. So go ahead. Thank you. Yes, my name is Michael Ayala, and uh, I live here in Rockland. My daughter graduated from Whitney High School, and um, I've got uh, nine grandchildren with one on the way, and uh, six of them live here in the area. So they will be attending at some point um, <laughs> schools. So. Um, with that said, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. First, I want to reiterate what Travis said in Thank you and congratulate you on your stances and your, and we voted you in the office for, for, for reasons and uh, you've stood by that and you've courageously uh, stood by your, your convictions and, and, and done what you thought was right for us and uh, we appreciate that. Um, my father came to the United States of America when he was 14 years old. He, uh, he, he bribed the border uh, patrol agents down in El Paso, Texas. Uh, he was born in, uh, in um, uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, one day when he was supposed to go get tacos for the Border Patrol, he just left and jumped a train and ended up in Bakersfield, California, went over the grapevine to L.A., and then uh, ended up in Montana working in the coal mines with uh, his sister's husband, uh, married. And, um, and, and with that said, uh, he, he met my mom, got married, and they, they were married until he passed away a few years ago. Um, when I was a junior in high school, my dad got picked up by immigration. I didn't even realize he wasn't a citizen. Um, when uh, we got an attorney, he became uh, a citizen later on. I asked him two questions. One, why did you never teach us Spanish? And his answer was, <clears throat> because we live in the United States of America. The second question I asked him was, were you mad that you got deported? And he said, why would I be mad? I broke the, I broke the law. And that's what should have happened. So um, that's what I was raised on. And 
What I want to say is this critical race theory that seems to be weaving its way into ethnic studies in the SEL program from what I've been able to read and, and, and learn about is dangerous. I never felt like a minority, and of course I've got light skin and blue eyes because my mom's Dutch and Irish, so I, I take her, but my brothers and sisters don't, and neither is my dad, and so I, was, I experienced both sides of prejudice. Um, I, I've, I've been on, on, on the white side, I've been on the, on the Mexican side, and those things. So I've been able to experience that and live that, and I do, I'm not saying there's not racial diversity in this, or, or, or prejudice in the country, there is. Um, but the only time I ever felt like a minority was my senior year in high school when they came into the class and said, everybody who's a, uh, applying for college, please raise their hand. Anybody who's a minority applying for college, raise their hand. I didn't raise my hand. And they came up and gave me a piece of paper with my name on it. And it's the first time I felt like a minority. I felt separated and segregated, and I didn't know what to feel. And I think this critical race theory, what it does is it puts those children, makes them feel different. I was just an American. That's, that's all I am. I'm just an American. And that's the way I felt, and that was the first time I felt different. So I think this critical race theory, what it does is it makes the children feel different, like they're supposed to be different, they're supposed to think about other people differently than, than they would otherwise. And I just hope that you continue to vote to not have that in your school district. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Ayala. <laughs> Millie Yan, and then behind Millie is Holly Cable. You'll have one minute. We'll go on to the one minute process for the rest of the cards tonight. Good evening, President Counter, trustees, Roger Stock, and district staff. I would like to thank Roger Stock and the rest of the district staff and Rockland Unified teachers who continue to deliver exceptional educational services to the students in our area, despite the negative vitriol that some of the school board trustees have introduced in our school system and the distractions they pose to pursue pet political agendas. I would also like to note um, certain things that uh, some board members could do a little bit better on. I would like to note a character failure of Tiffany Sadoff for lying and misleading parents about her Thank religious you. Thank background you, Ms. Yen. when she ran for Ms. her Yen. position. Ms. Yen, no more. Are you infringing on my First Amendment rights? I am asking you to be respectful. You are infringing on my First Amendment rights. I am asking rights. you to be respectful. You I am to. relaying facts. You have 13 seconds. She called herself an education program director on the election ballot when she is listed as a minister for the Northern California and Nevada Assemblies of God and is co-director of Destiny Community All Center. Right, thank you, Ms. Yan. Holly Cable. And then Curtis Borton behind Holly, er, behind Holly Cable. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, board members and superintendent stock. My name is Holly Cable. I've, ha I've been a resident of Rockland for 29 years, and I've raised three children here in RUSD. I've also been a teacher here for over 10 years. I'm here tonight to ask you, the board, to please take a stand against the vaccine mandate for teachers staff and students by even considering this mandate you are infringing upon the rights and freedom of your employees and your students i'm here tonight for my fellow teachers and students that have found ourselves in an impossible situation it seems that soon it will be mandated for all teachers staff and students to be vaccinated and i strongly believe this is a violation of our constitutional rights i'm devastated because my job my calling seems to be coming to an end you see, I don't believe anyone should be mandated to have this vaccine. It's not safe. It hasn't been proven to be safe, and it shouldn't be mandated under any circumstances. Thank you, Ms. Cable. I beg you That's to do some of your own research. Join other districts in suing this dictator. Stand up for all of your teachers and all of your students. I don't want to walk away from Thank my you. career or my students. Thank I don't you, want to walk away from our district, and I don't want our families to have to lose this education. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cable. Curtis, Curtis Borden and then Jen Brookover. It's Borton, but that's okay. It's only been the ninth time. Um, first off, I want to say I'm sorry that you guys get abused by both sides. Uh, I know that must be tough. Um, you were elected to a non-paying position, which is the beginning of some people's political careers and the ending of some people's volunteer careers. But uh, you did follow the rules with a 
with a mask mandate, so I want to thank you for that because my kid got to go back to school and he's been super happy and I go to school and I see all the kids, they're super happy. So I know there's all the political grandstanding, the actors come in to yell, scream and get applause at a school board meeting. Um, and you guys did the right thing. You'll do the right thing again. You'll vote for the thing you have to, you know. And it won't even be a vote. You're gonna have to do it. You'll pass it off to other people. I am so sorry that kids have to live through this though. I'm sorry, you have to witness what supposed to be a public policy uh, event gets turned into a political theater event. This is not the way government's supposed to run, and I hope your ambitions to work in government stay with you to do what's best for the greater good and not right, fall to this Bur type of things. Thank you, Mr. Borden. Oh, by the way, out of curiosity, I gotta ask, you interrupted that one, but not the other one when she went over. You're at a minute. I know I'm at a minute, but I'm saying that's a, hey, little, Mr. Bit, that's a little bit worse. Thank so. you, Mr. Borden. All right. Jen Brookover and then Mark Hartman behind Jen Brookover. I have many questions and concerns tonight. Um, some of the questions are, are any of you medical professionals? I didn't know In-N-Out Burger are medical professionals and have you surveyed all the parents in our district? All of them. Have you surveyed all of the teachers in our district? Because they are the ones in the, in the classroom. So there are many questions about board policies that I have. Um, Tiffany, I appreciate, and it is none of my business if you have a medical exemption. It's not. It's a violation of HIPAA to ask you that. But I will ask you, can you wear a face shield, please? Because that doesn't Please affect. be respectful, ma'am. And it shouldn't be political about public health. It shouldn't be political to be, quote, unquote, divisive when we're talking about a pandemic. No one is medical professionals, and I will take our advice from them. So many questions tonight, but my main question is when you spoke at the um, anti-vax meeting on Monday, the... Thank you, Ms. Brookover. Okay. I was interrupted. Mark Hartman and Kareen Meyer. Thank you. My name is Mark Hartman. I have a daughter in Placer Academy. And... Um, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Go ahead. You guys are in a really tough spot. You guys are in a tough spot, so thank you for um, what you do. I appreciate many of your comments early on. Um, I am personally against the medical mandates. Um, I don't believe that it is a Trump or Republican thing. I think it's across the board. You've got many prominent uh, Democrats and traditional lefties that um, have been um, against the mandates. That'd be John Stewart, Bill Maher, Alex Berenson, Naomi Wolf, and a um, Clinton advisor. Um, I think that it's a very divisive subject. I appreciate that you guys um, have taken a stand. I want to encourage you on to plead that you um, listen to what some of the people who have spoken before me have said, which is to please be proactive. Work with those other school boards. Um, do whatever you can to keep this from our kids. The science does not um, warrant the uh, mandates. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Hartman. Kareen Meyer and Paul Gallo. Okay. And then Paul Gallo behind her. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I would just like to acknowledge that we are on Neeson on land again. Um, second, I'd also like to acknowledge that every parent in this room, whether, what, whether we agree or not, um, we have this innate drive to protect our young, and it's an incredible force, and I acknowledge that with everybody here. Um, this does bring me to my first topic, um, and I would like the district and the board to directly respond to a series of racist incidents, including racial slurs at Gran Granite Oaks Middle School and Rockland High School, as well as incidents of racist vandalism. I understand that I'm not talking about ethnic studies, CRT, the mandate, nothing. I think we can all agree that racist bullying is wrong, and we need to respond. I made a comment a few meetings ago to communicate how students in the LGBTQ community exist, and your silence speaks volumes. So the lack of response of these incidents to me is unacceptable. Um, I sent an email to follow up about those chalk it up events and have yet to receive a response. Um, but I just wanna say if you ignore this, it's just not gonna go away. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Gallo, and then behind Paul Gallo is Jay Reed. Uh, Paul Gallo from Rockland. I have uh, numerous uh, grandchildren that go to Rockland, numerous schools. Um, we live in extraordinary times. 
and it's going to require extraordinary courage to get us through this. And I see four people up here who have that courage. And I wanted, want you to know that I really appreciate, and many of these people here, appreciate your courage. This is a, a, a very difficult job. Uh, you're dealing with our children, the lives of our children. And we appreciate it. And Tiffany, I love without the mask. Uh, thank you for what you've done these past, this past year. And I, I really do support that you stand up and uh, oppose this uh, ma mandate um, and take a vote and stand there and fight for it. And you have a lot of people that are going to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallo. Jay Reed. And then Larry Tajiri behind Jay. My name is Jay Reed. I have a 6th uh, and 10th grader. I'm also one of the plaintiffs that's suing the state over its quarantine testing and masking protocols. I'd like to commend this board. First off, it's hard to sit up there and take the vitriol. Uh, I know if someone called me a racist, I would come on glutes, and that's why I'm not elected official, so thank you. Um, Tiffany, thank you very much for your comments on Monday. Uh, we uh, really appreciate you representing families in this area. One of the more, most confusing parts of this pandemic has been, when's it over? Rick, I heard you say tonight at least three times that you're not going to make a decision until you have the data, the numbers, or the metrics. And we all agree. We need to know what the metrics are, what the off-ramps are for this. And not to send this board on another fool's errand by writing a letter to CDPH, but I think that requesting uh, public participation in helping determine what those metrics are is warranted. And Roseville Joint Union High School District in August passed a resolution um, that said they weren't going to uh, do student or staff vaccine mandates. Thank so you, take Mr. a look Reed. at that resolution. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Larry Tajiri, and then behind Larry is Jennifer Lindsay. Hey, Larry Tajiri, uh, kids at Whitney, I'll try to make it quick since I only have a minute. This is actual data from Johns Hopkins. Here's the United States uh, vaccination rates, they're over 50, about 50%. But look at India, it's less than 20%. Um, I wanted to show about Israel, they got the booster shot, they're the only ones that are moving forward with booster. But look, look at their data, Israel's data is way out of control, don't have much time to go through all this. Um, United States, here's their data. Remember when India, um, they're having all the problems, their data is way down in the floor. How is that possible? But I'll get into that, yes, exactly. Um, here's their data, their de these are deaths. So it's almost zero. India is almost zero. Remember here, back in, in June, media was saying like everyone's dying in India. It was 50% higher than the United States. The United States is now 20, to 20 times, 2,000% higher than India because they're using ivermectin. The, the president of Brazil said history and science will hold countries up accountable. You, he said that to the UN because we're not treating them country, um, our residents thank with, you. I Thank you. Jennifer Lindsay, and then Carrie Hamilton. Go, Ms. Lindsay. Hello. Um, sorry, I'm going to shorten my prepared message that I had um, down to a minute. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank all of you for all your hard work as a parent as well as an employee for the district. I truly appreciate all that you did last year to get our kids back to school full time. It was pure joy to see the happiness on their faces of my kindergartners. Um, to the beautiful ladies that were attacked so viciously last month, please know that you are appreciated and that um, you have a lot of support in our community. <clears throat> Lastly, I'd like to address the vaccine mandate and ask that you partner with the neighboring school districts to push back against this state mandate. As stated earlier, Western Placer Board is wanting to push back against the state, and I encourage you to look into that and work with them. I fully support this, and as, th th I fully support this, and as a parent as well as an employee, I strongly believe that we, the people, should have the right to decide for Thank ourselves you, if we get this COVID vaccine. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. <laughs> Carrie Hamilton. Carrie Hamilton. All right, Christy Barrows, Christy Barrows, and then Amanda Dixon.
Hi, my name is Christy Burroughs, and I have three children that have gone through the school, one currently at Valley View Elementary, who is a kindergartner there, who is um, on the spectrum, and last year he was allowed not to wear a mask. This year they're forcing him to wear a mask. He goes to school crying every day, every day. My middle school, who goes to Granite, who was shown that same video that was addressed earlier, came home and told me not only did he have to write an essay, they discussed it in class, and then he was pretty much ostracized because he's one of the few people not vaccinated. So now the, se the class is segregated. He's so humiliated, he said he does not want to go back to school. He asked me to homeschool. So now I get to come here and tell you that even though I have a child who graduated and loved Rockland, I volunteered so much for Rockland. This has just ended my children's school, so now I'm looking into homeschooling. Thank you, Ms. Burroughs. Right. Amanda Dixon. Hi. My name is Amanda Dixon. I'm a wife and mother here in Rockland. We have two boys, four and six. My six-year-old is an autistic uh, son in a special ed class with an IEP at Rockland Elementary. I love and respect our teachers. I'm on the site council and PTA, and I bring gifts to them once a week. My family washes our hands. We stay home if we're sick. I take everyone's temperatures in the AM and PM. We don't wear masks. I can't, my son can't. He needs to see emotions he doesn't understand. Let people make their own best decisions for themselves and their family. 14 days to flatten the curve. The science is here now. Masks don't help healthy people, but rather hurts them, including mentally. Wear a mask or don't. Get a shot or don't. Either way, it's an individual choice. Everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. I found out there's more than a handful of us good parents willing to give the fight of our lives if these nonsense draconian mandates are pushed through. Let's turn this back around. Let's bring back smiles and hugs and handshakes. Thank you. Ms. Thank you so much to the board members who know the difference between Thank right you. and wrong. Thank God, you, Ms. Dixon. God bless. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to take a quick five minute uh, time. We're going to read through all the public comments and then we'll move on to item number 12.1. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.
All right. So we'll, we'll finish it up right here, folks. Um, trustees? Go across. Trustees, do you have any items that you would to be placed on a pending agenda? Okay, got that. Rick, anything for a pending agenda? All right. So seeing that, um, so we'll just set, the board meeting is now adjourned. Oh, I'm adjourned. To